It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Alex Lindsay's here. Andy Anako, Jason Snell. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things. Apple's slowdown in China and why it's a delicate balancing act. Emails inside Apple tell us why there never will be iMessages on Android. And Apple's building a live television advertising network. Should Apple be in the ad business? That and a whole lot more coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 843, recorded Tuesday, November 8th, 2022. Prefabulated Amulet. This episode of MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution built around honest security. You can meet your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash MacBreak to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by 8Sleep. For a limited time, 8Sleep is offering Twit listeners up to $400 off their Sleep Fit holiday bundle by visiting 8sleep.com slash MacBreak. After November 30th, go to 8sleep.com slash MacBreak to check out the pod and look for other exclusive holiday savings or save $150 at checkout with our normal offer. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we get together and talk about the latest Apple news with three of my favorite Apple pundits, Jason Snell, sixcolors.com. Hello, Jason. Hello, Leo. Good to be here. Nice nice to see you in the rain. You said you had an That's inch. Right. I made it through the rain. <laughs> no singing. <laughs> but no. I blame it on the rain. Okay. <laughs> We've had the singing already. Here comes the, the rain show. again. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, also, Andy Yanako, WGBH Boston. Good to see you, Andrew. That's good. I'm, I'm only happy when it's rain, not when it rains. I'm, I'm really only happy when it's complicated. <laughs> well, it was complicated earlier. Which, <laughs> it was. We're uh, moving. Uh, <laughs> we are using Zoom right now, uh, but we're using Zoom with uh, a, a different computer for each participant. That's how we did the isolated audio and video. But there is a new Zoom technology, which Alex has been talking a lot about, called Zoom ISO. And we we tried it this morning, and it didn't work too well. So we're, we're starting a little late. This is Alex Lindsay, who is the mastermind behind OfficeHours.Global and the king of Zoom ISO. He's the one who told us all about it. We use a lot of Zoom ISO. It's our pipeline's a little different, but it's but it's uh, but we. Uh, I, uh, I, I I shot a video of you demonstrating your pipeline, which I sent to John. <laughs> Do this. Well, that, that's that's the little pipeline because that's eight. You know, in in office hours, we can do up to twenty people so at one cool. time. You know, and I have to say, cell. in our preliminary testing, it really is much better. There's uh, looks almost better, sounds better, almost it sounds better, looks better, and there's almost no latency, which means we don't have yeah. those uh, interruption problems that have plagued us since you know. 2004 so yeah. <laughs> since the bush administration since the bush administration <laughs> yeah, exactly to be to be frank um, we want to thank andy carluccio who uh, is the uh, event engineering manager at zoom he came by provided us with some equipment showed us how to set it up uh, he did a great job thank you especially to alex Lindsay, who has been the uh, master of that and next week you will hear the new improved zoom iso version of mac break weekly so Biggest Apple news of the week, <laughs> Apple admitting that COVID shutdowns in China are impacting uh, the manufacture of iPhone 14 Pro and Max. I guess they don't really care too much about the iPhone 14 because <laughs> nobody's buying that. This is the quote from their uh, press release. COVID-19 restrictions have temporarily impacted the primary iPhone 14 Pro and iPhone 14 Pro Max assembly facility located in Zhengzhou, China. The facility is operating at significantly reduced capacity. And this is, of course, uh, due to COVID-19. We expect lower iPhone, iPhone Pro, uh, 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max shipments than we previously anticipated. You will receive uh, longer wait times to get your new products. So if you hadn't ordered and, re and received, I guess, I guess if you'd ordered and got a date, you're probably cool. But if you're ordering now, you may not uh, get it. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked. Jason, is this... Have people started complaining about this? 
I mean, they're, they're definitely those dates are pushing back. So we're yeah. definitely seeing some of that happening. And this is like this happened actually in the spring in but it was in Shanghai and it was the Mac right. assembly facility. And it actually drove Mac sales down for a quarter and then they rebounded last quarter. But there was that period in there where if you tried to buy a Mac, it would say you need to wait a month or two, which was really unprecedented. Right. Like the Tim Cook machine, every every one that comes off the assembly line is bought at that moment, right? Like that's the dream for <laughs> Tim Cook. And, uh, you know, the Mac stuff was hard, but the Mac is only uh, a portion of Apple's revenue. Uh, the iPhone is more than half of Apple's revenue most of the time. And and this is the most popular product, right? The iPhone 12 Pro, uh, 14 Pro. So it, this is this is brutal. I mean, like they're... they're they, this came out on a Sunday. It is sort of mandated that this is a material effect on their business. But I think what it is strongly suggesting is that when they when they uh, report their results in three months, iPhone sales are going to be hit by this because people are it's this is their quarter. This is their highest quarter for everything, including the iPhone and their most popular iPhones are not going to be available or in limited quantities. And uh, maybe they can spin things up. But you get the sense from what's happened before when they when they sort of taper off everything kind of stops and then it doesn't just flip back to 100 percent. there's a whole process they have to go through to get back up to speed i just tried to order an iphone 14 pro december 9th delivery which isn't the worst i mean that's a month it, you know that's not a it's right. not like next it's year just, it's just not tim cook's ideal right yeah, yeah. you want to you want to you want to make as many <laughs> as you can and, sell and i think i think that we i think that there are so many issues right now with China production, Chinese production, <laughs> that that I think that you're seeing Apple and a lot of other folks starting to try to diversify. Now, some of it's required. So Brazil and India require them to um, build some of it in their country uh, to sell into that market. Um, but I think that you're also looking at Vietnam um, is, is, is benefiting from um, kind of a move out of China. And I think that you'll see a lot of companies continue to do that. I think that there's a lot of concern, as we've talked about before, around doing it all between the variety of issues with COVID to infrastructural issues that China is starting to experience to Taiwan. There's just a lot of risk that, that, that is getting applied to everybody's production that's happening in the country. There is, it was an interesting piece in financial times uh, yesterday, Apple's bargain with Beijing access to China's factories and consumers. Uh, and the point of it was that Tim Cook has played a very canny game meeting with president. Xi. Uh, many times pre-pandemic uh, to basically get free reign in China, which has benefited them hugely in terms of sales. And, of course, uh, it means uh, that it's important. Chinese manufacturing is important. Um, and I yeah, think it, it may also mean that... Do you think it might mean that Apple is might be slow to pull out of... Uh, pull manufacturing out of China. Like it's that's a, an important tip well, for tech. For, for everyone, it's five to 10 well, years. And I don't think they're take pulling a while out. Anyway. I think that they're yeah. diversifying. I don't think it's going to be like, oh, we're not going to do any more work in China. I think that they just need to move it from 100% down to, you know, 30%. And I think would be make a big difference in, in the ability to flex if they needed to. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, it was an interesting article because it, it, it did make the point that, uh, Apple has not, Apple has succeeded not only getting uh, getting into a good relationship with China, but also tying a lot of China's manufacturing prestige with Apple. So they're very, very much in a slightly symbiotic relationship where they benefit each other, which is why uh, they, 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 uh, Tim Cook has this back channel pipeline to the, the person who can get things done. So if you need manufacturing, if you need a problem solved, if you need a factory opened, uh, if you need uh, uh, diversions of resources, to make sure that your product line remains uh, remains free and flexible, you're going to get it. It also made the good point that um, the sanctions against China from the U.S. has hurt Chinese uh, phone makers uh, and actually uh, enhanced uh, Apple and making Apple. I think the number I think they're saying the number one tech company, if not the number one phone manufacturer in China right now, with 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 some Jason Snell like graphs to uh, back up. Their yeah, plan. this Ooh. is actually the interesting graph. Huawei. Remember when Huawei was banned in the U.S. Chinese consumers patriotically jumped on Huawei and you could see that they had as much as like 27% of the market in the first half of 2020. It has plummeted and Apple has grown commensurately. Uh, at Huawei's share, share of the Chinese market says the Financial Times plummeted from a high of 29% in mid-2020 to just 7% 
2022, well, think, while Apple's share jumped from 9 to 17 percent. Well, and I think also the, the, the Huawei phones, I've had some Huawei phones and they're, they're just not very good. <laughs> Like, like, I think that's, yeah. the, I mean, that, that's the problem is you're competing, um, you know, for a, you know, if you're competing in the luxury market, the Huawei phones just aren't really competitive with some, yeah. even other Chinese phones. Yeah, it's a, Apple, the iPhone is the prestige brand uh, that as you have more people going, as the, as the middle class is getting a little bit more the same way that the middle class in the United States was in the 50s and 60s saying, hey, I want to make sure that I've got the great car, I've got the great house, I've got the great whatever, I've got the new washing machine. Uh, the, peop, the thing that the middle class wants are prestige Apple phones and not domestic made, you know, <laughs> no domestic made label uh, common phones that they can get uh, with their, in their current uh, stuff. Yeah, the symbiosis here is, I think, really interesting. The idea that it's very easy to look at China and say, well, China is this giant country. And so like Apple needs China and China doesn't need Apple. And that's right. not true, right? Like it, it goes both ways. And that's the reason Apple has escaped in times when, especially during the Trump administration, right? There was all of the saber rattling and and like, we're going to, we're going to, you know, nobody buy anything from the, these various Chinese companies. And it would have been so easy for them to be like, well, fine, Apple is now out of China. And that didn't happen for a reason, for because they've cultivated this relationship. But it does, and, and you know, from China's perspective, it gives them manufacturing prestige. It does. It makes the people in China really happy. They love having the ability to buy an Apple product. And if that went away, they would be a little less happy. And as much power as the Chinese Communist Party has, uh, you you don't want to make the people real angry with you, right? Like you you want to <laughs> have some level where they feel like they're comfortable and so they're not going to rock the boat. So there, there's a lot going on in that. It's funny now, though, to look at it and think the problem is that if it gets out of balance at all, Apple has all their eggs in that basket. That's the right. Like it's yeah. not all they are doing some iPhone manufacturing in India and some in Brazil. And, and, and I've heard about a bunch of stuff that they're trying to spin up in Vietnam. And like they are trying. It seems like the Shanghai shutdown actually back in the spring was one of those moments where they realized uh, they they actually need to start moving on not relying only on China, but they're they're that relationship yeah benefits China and benefits Apple. It really is symbiotic in a in a very yeah. strange way. It it still underscores the problems that uh, the, the risks that Apple is taking. Uh, where what happens if China decides to invade Taiwan? What if what if they decide to even increase their their crackdowns on Hong Kong? Uh, what if there is uh, uh, there are human rights violations that become on on the world scale kind of like uh, Russia's invasion of of Ukraine? Is that going to how danger how caustic will that relationship become for Apple to be so closely tied with China? So it's it's a dancing act for sure. They're cut between a rock and a hard place though. If they want this Chinese market, and it's been I know from these uh, colorful graphs. At sixcolors.com, the China market has been a big uh, mm. propellant in Apple's success over the last couple of years. And the growth there is very important to Apple. Uh, this is also from the Financial Times. Apple's worked hard to satisfy the tastes of Chinese customers. When local competitors wrote, rolled out smartphones with bigger screens like the Huawei Honor, more advanced cameras with low-light photography, Xiaomi's stuff is pretty amazing, and a dual SIM card slot, it was Apple's Chinese employees who pushed the Cupertino-based company to follow suit, said one person close to the China operations. I might question that. I think there's been pressure, yeah. global pressure towards in those directions. But Tim Cook himself has credited feedback from Chinese customers for a, quote, ton of features. This is Cook speaking now, including night mode and a QR code reader. Again, I'm quoting from uh, FT. Even 5G in a lot of ways, says Cook, was energized in China because China's so far ahead in the coverage model well, it's, for 5G. And, 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 so list, So we. this is Tim Cook finishing up. He was telling this, uh, it was on a, a, a social media uh, interview with a 22-year-old Chinese student. So we listen very carefully to our customers there. Yeah, and, and it's a big customer base, you know. Right. So, so they, they listen a lot to the United States. They listen I think a lot so to China because those are two of their yeah. biggest uh, by the, customers. By the way, so we should also difference. point out that Brazil facility is built not just to diversify, but because Brazil has a huge tariff on stuff yeah, not made, it's made in Brazil. And right. India is the same Same way. thing yeah. with India. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's what I was saying. Yeah. But it also gives Apple a little plausible deniability when China goes, why are you making iPhones somewhere other than here? They're like, well, we have to. tariffs, well, and, man. Yeah. You know, tariffs. And the, are, we don't want Chinese. to, President Xi. Understand. <laughs> and right now, iPhone well, is 90, production is 95% in China. 
Yeah. Right. And we, and again, we comply, this we is, comply with all local laws and yeah. we're forced to China. I'm sorry. <laughs> when, well, we're, and, and I, when we're forced to. <laughs> and, and I think that, I think that the thing is, is that the COVID breakdowns and everything else also give them a little cover to just start yep. stepping away going, well, this was really a big deal for us. We lost billions of dollars. Um, we need to make sure that we can keep on doing it. So I think that they, they've got a little coverage. I think that the big thing that I think most people are worried about is Taiwan, you know, after, you know, how do you, you know, because it just was untenable to stay in Russia when, after they went into, into, Ukraine. Um, some companies held out for a little while, but it looks, it's just the damage to the brand is so heavy. And for Apple, it would be devastating. You know, if, if China went into Taiwan, Apple would have to stop. Like they would have to, like they, they wouldn't be able to maintain their brand if China's going into Taiwan. And so they have to figure out a way that they're going to be able to, and, and services help them too. Like services are something they don't need to do in China. I'll tell <laughs> so, you what. So that's, that, that's, that's the issue. If you wanted to appoint a diplomat to China, Tim Cook would be a pretty good <laughs> choice, right? And well, he did that in also. Because he's really, he, he feels like he's a very calm, rational actor. I think he acts in the best interests of his company and to some degree the U.S. I think he, can, he considers that. Um, well, you have to compare thing. Apple's success in China with Meta and Alphabet and Netflix, all of which are banned in China. Uh, he well, and he's also been said, able to let's save, let's save this relationship. He looks at where his lines really can be like, he'll, you know, he'll give you the cloud data, but he won't give you the phone data. He will, he'll, he'll look at um, also how to delay things in long in EU, in the EU, they were able to <laughs> delay the USB-C ruling until it didn't matter anymore. Um, you know, and I think that he did a pretty good job at managing his relationship with Trump. Uh, he's obviously not a big Probably not. I, I would doubt that Tim Cook voted for Trump, <laughs> but he was able to maintain <laughs> uh, a, a, a relationship with him that kept uh, kept Apple out of the mix of all the fighting back and forth that, that Trump did with China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is true. You, it's it is a deal with a. You do have to be concerned about it, making deals with the devil. Uh, the the uh, the legitimacy that it, that he gave Trump by sitting right next to him and uh, and participating in this sort of stuff when you might want to have put some distance and not sort of help people you allowing Trump to use uh, an Apple manufacturing facility in Texas for a really, really, really bad photo op uh, about how go the, the benefits that Trump is building to, to bring jobs out of bring manufacturing out of uh, uh, out of Asia and back into the United States. That and th those are f almost philosophical questions, uh, uh, questions to have. Uh, but it's uh, the, the, the other difference is that Apple is not in a business where it really threatens China. Apple is, Apple is in a business of make manufacturing hardware where this is something that benefits China by, again, giving them lots of manufacturing jobs, giving them very, very well paying, very uh, high manufacturing jobs where workers are treated extremely well compared to pretty much every other manufacturer. It's whereas it's impossible for Google to participate. It's impossible for Twitter to participate. It's impossible for Facebook to participate because their product is all about free access to information and free access to uh, to people forming groups with each other, which are which is anathema to what the government wants its people to be able to do. So, yeah, Apple definitely has a leg has several legs up on everybody, every other major United States tech company in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, big concern is the, I mean, and we've touched on it here, but Ben Thompson on Stratechery this week wrote about the, he referred to it in a good way, the black swan event, right? The idea of the thing that is almost the unexpected event that nobody thinks will occur or could occur, but it occurs mm -hmm. anyway. And that is that the black swan event for Apple is what Andy said about China attacks Taiwan. Uh, it's similar to Russia and Ukraine. You end up in a situation where it's untenable for um, for Western companies to be in China anymore. What happens to Apple? And it's not good, right? It's really yeah, yeah. not good. And that is the, and Apple is the most, you know, one of the most valuable companies in the world, one of the most powerful companies in the world. But if they lose their Chinese manufacturing, let aside the, the size of the accessible market for their products, if they lose their manufacturing base in China, you just have a situation where suddenly there are no more iPhones or Macs available for years like it's well, apple's got the cash they can survive but it, that is for that is long? an event so catastrophic well yeah for, well the, and that's the thing it's an event so catastrophic that it's like saying well it's a very low chance we're going to be hit by a meteor or an asteroid or a comet right. but if it does happen we all die well, right like it, it is that what, kind of an event yeah the math the math that i often use when i talk about when so you know the mathematical de definition for me for risk is the chance of something happening multiplied by the by the impact you know like the 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 consequence 
consequences, you know? And so yeah. the con- yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The chance is very low, but the consequences are so devastating that the risk is very high. And I think that the, um, that it is, uh, uh I think that Apple has to keep moving away. I think that they also have to start thinking about their cash position. They, they spend a lot of money on dividends. They spend a lot of money on um, buybacks and they have to start thinking about making sure that they have the cash, ca- the cash position to weather a pretty heavy storm. And I think a lot of companies that are heavily invested in China need to think about it because, you know, China has not given up on Taiwan and, and we can see in Ukraine again, you, they're not going to be able to, if China goes into Taiwan, these companies are not going to be able to maintain their brand and maintain the production at the same time. It's going to be you know, very some, hard. It's going to be withering. There's some interesting economic pressure on China now because as we've cut off high-end chip, U.S. high-end chips to uh, China, they may well be eyeing Taiwan as the way to get that back. You know, take over Taiwan, you get TSMC, you get yeah. a number of foundries that make those high-end chips. NVIDIA did an interesting thing this week. They announced that they were going to continue to sell a lower-end A100 chip to China to end around those restrictions. Uh, I don't think, I don't think getting, I don't think, I think, I think that from a speech many years ago, I think that would be ashes in their mouth. If they went, they went to the Taiwan thinking they were going to get TM. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, you know, ashes like I, in I, their I, mouth I, is a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it would, it would be, there'd be nothing left by the time they got there because no one would be doing any work with them, you know? And so, you know, going yeah. in that way would be, would be brutal. Uh, yeah. This is uh, Ben Thompson uh, talking about this points out that China focused on manufacture labor centric components like assembling an iPhone uh, and less so on the high technology things like uh, chips and uh, and so they are now in a tough position because of being cut off China's going to have well, to and, and the, its the trouble industry. they have is they have a lot of tough positions you know they have yeah. a they have their their you know they have a population bomb that is massive, like atomic sized, you know, that, that, that is going to, you know, because they went to one child, they can't get people to start having kids again, you know, and they, and they're, you know, they can't restart that system. And it is, you know, they're going to, they're, they're get becoming extremely top heavy. So it, it is, they're not in a stable place and it's not a good place for a company to be have, for Apple or anybody else to have 95% of their production in China would made sense 10 years ago, made sense five years ago, does not make sense anymore. And, and they, and although as, as uh, as Ben points out, China has unlimited money and infinite motives, motivation to figure this out. For instance, Uh, they can throw money at it because one of the issues of with chip production is yield, right? They don't have to worry if they've get a low yield to just make more of them, right? Things like that. Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. They don't have the <laughs> EUV technology. And that was a big part of getting TSMC down to those smaller, you know, five, seven, five and three nanometer. Um, and not all of it's brute force. Like, like it's not, no, it's, I, it's I don't not. think that like no. brute, brute force and high loss may not, may not be enough yeah. to, uh, to, 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 to turn the corner there. And so they're, you know, they've got a lot of, um, China's got a lot of trouble coming in the next decade and so yeah. it's just but it's that's bad for anyone right? connected to him because trouble for, it's well, trouble means trouble for everybody president yeah. she yeah. has to start shaking the tree instability yep. yep yep well this isn't a geopolitical podcast i'm sure there are others who will do a better job of it's, an, it's that. an apple podcast so but it turns into geopolitics very very easily yeah because a lot. yeah when you, when you, whenever you're talking about a tech company with the reach of Apple uh, or Microsoft or Google, it doesn't take long before you find out that you, you think that the the simplest thing they decide to do can move mountains. Even even uh, let's not get into the rat hole of uh, of uh, Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. But one of one of the one of the ten Titanic things about this is how does this affect some? How does this affect uh, the world's richest man who wants to continue to be the world's richest man who now has uh, a fully armed and operational uh, a battle station for propaganda for any government that he wants to do business with. It's like, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember when we'd have, we'd have long, long and luscious arguments about, yeah, but you know, I think that go, I don't think anybody needs a five megapixel camera on an iPhone. I mean, if you do the, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that there was a time we didn't really have to think that much about human rights. And now we really do have to. It's an interesting battle. Uh, speaking of that last night, because we had a, uh, a blood moon event. We had a lunar eclipse and there was a battle, I think in the many social networks between iPhone and uh, pixel seven, photos of the uh, of the eclipse <laughs> i think the pixel 7 won i hate to say it but it was close it was definitely close uh let's take a little break andy anako alex Lindsay, jason snell thrilled to have you guys here as always for mac break weekly and all of you 
Our show today brought to you by Collide. For teams who use Slack, Collide is the best way to get your IT in order. I think uh, IT admins, I know, I know a, a lot of them. A lot of you are in IT, and you probably know this syndrome. You feel like, you know, we we have to we have to tighten all the nuts down. We got to batten all the hatches. You know, we got to put crazy glue in the USB ports. Uh, but we also have to protect performance and employees' privacy. And you're too. You're caught between, caught between a rock and a hard place. You got to turn your, you know, safeguard your company data against hacks and breaches, but you can't turn your workplace into 1984. And I think sometimes users really feel that way with traditional MDMs because then the IT team has complete access and control over company devices, perfectly legal and reasonable. But here's the problem. Employees get frustrated. So they, instead of using their work machines, start using... They're private machines, and they bring them into the office. They BYOD big time. Or if they continue to use their work laptops for personal activities, then there's a huge privacy concern there because suddenly you have access to their photos and their browser history. Before you know it, your end users are complaining about all the security agents slowing down their laptops. Developers are, you know, because these guys, you know, the, the engineers are frustrated by the lack of autonomy. They know there's a better way. People start secretly working on their personal devices just to get things done and stay private. It's easy to fall into the trap of top-down security. But Collide wants you to know it's not the only option. Collide, K-O-L-I-D-E, is an endpoint security solution built around honest security. And I love this philosophy. Employees aren't your biggest security risk. They're your biggest allies. But you have to turn them into allies, right? And you do that by having a relationship based on transparency and informed consent and, and enrolling them, in effect, in being your allies, saying, you know what? We're all in this together. We want to keep the company data secure and private. We want to keep our network secure. And it takes all of us to do that. Collide works by notifying your employees of security issues uh, via Slack. So if you're a house that uses Slack, as we are, this is great. It educates them on why you know, why you need to do this. It'll give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to resolve the problems themselves. In fact, it all starts, the relationship starts with a Slack uh, DM saying, hey, I'm Collide. Let's get this installed together. So it's, it's, it's teamwork from the very, very start. For IT and security teams, you're going to love Collide because you get the total visibility and it's completely cross-platform. Mac, Windows, and Linux devices it actually can address high-risk issues that you can't really solve through brute force or automation. because you're And now your end users are helping. And they can see exactly why and how every piece of data is being collected because Collide has a user privacy center and an open source code base. So it, everybody wins in this scenario. You can meet your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash MacBreak to find out how. If you follow that link, they're going to get a goodie bag. There's some there's nice t-shirts. There's the Collide stickers, the uh, beer coaster. <laughs> and you get all that just for activating a free trial. K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash MacBreak. No credit card required. Collide.com slash MacBreak. 14-day free trial. I, this is the right way. The right way uh, to do things. Thank you, Collide, for supporting MacBreak Weekly. Of course, the other uh, big story uh, of the week is Apple and ads. And uh, we talked last week about the gambling ads and Apple's decision to put a halt on that. Now, 9to5Mac reports Apple is building an advertising network for live television. This is part of the Major League uh, Soccer deal. So it looks like they're going to be selling ads into the soccer games, the football games, pardon me. <laughs> the European <laughs> football games. <laughs> no, Amer but it's American, so it's soccer. Major so League. it's soccer. Major League Soccer. We call, we call it soccer. It must be offensive uh, to the ear to people uh, around the world who yeah, call it football. They, they, sh they, they need to quiet down because soccer is a term invented in England to oh, refer really? to association football. Soccer is short for oh, association okay. football. It's an English term, and they like to get Americans with it and say, oh, soccer, football. it's called football. It's like, well, we've got our own football, so to differentiate, we use a different European <laughs> soccer term. 
<laughs> that you invented, by the way, sir, with your top hat and your <laughs> monocle. Uh, and uh, we'll call it soccer in America, okay? So there. That's just how it has to be. The, 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 the proper response to any gaff, gaff like that is that, yeah, and you stole like um, ha- you stole like three quarters of the stuff from the British Museum. Give the Elgin marbles back, <laughs> and then we'll talk about soccer versus we'll football. About soccer. Uh, Apple has a 10-year deal, as you know, with the Major League Soccer, MLS. Uh, and... By the way, you'll have to sign up for a separate subscription to watch those it's, games. It's complicated. It's complicated, right? They're going to make some of them available for free, and you don't even need to be a TV Plus person. Yeah. They're going to be make more games available for TV Plus subscribers, but if you want all of the games, you have to buy basically an annual pass to see all the MLS games. So it's this weird kind of multiple tiers, and then they're going to produce the games with MLS, and unlike Major League Baseball, where that deal... MLB network, their cable network produced and sold the ads for that for the uh, for those games. For uh, MLS, it looks like Apple wants to sell the ads themselves, which brings us to yeah. to this story. All um, three tiers, by the way, will yeah. have ads. Even if you're paying for Major League Soccer, you're still going to get some ads. And the Sounds name like- Todd Teresi once again surfaces <laughs> like an <laughs> evil man. serpent. He is the company's vice president of advertising platforms, and he's been in the he's been in the hot seat for the last few weeks uh so apple's reaching out uh to advertisers they're going to do it themselves um is that a problem i don't think so i mean so- one of the things about soccer is you can't really have uh ads in the middle of the game you gotta wait and it's not like football where there's a a pause every five seconds right or baseball yeah, or baseball. There's plenty of room for ads in football and baseball, which is, I think, why they thrived on our shores, to be honest. <laughs> Meanwhile, F1 racing and, and soccer, those international sports, there's no room for an ad. What do they how do they well, who made these rules up? I think that I think that there's a couple of places that you can put ads. One is, is if you you know, you can put them in the graphics. That's what they also, do, right? Yeah. And they also in soccer, they put them they, they replace the LEDs that are in the background with um you know they they have that that tool has been man i saw them demo it's that not green screen right but it's some way no they no, no this is smart replacement yeah, yeah they're keying stuff in and what they do is they have to they have to um to figure out what, what the camera has to be calibrated to the field the cameras that do it are calibrated to the field so that it has a 3d representation and it knows where it is and so on and so forth and um and so now the camera to, can move and the, the ad still move the ad hand until weirdly <laughs> Pan and tilt, except for, right. I mean, there are a couple cameras, I think, that um, that you get telemetry data, like a spider cam. Um, uh, you can get telemetry data from the from the cable cam. But generally, it's fixed cameras doing pan and tilt, which is a lot easier to do. Yeah. And so um, so anyway, you can, but that's how, and, and it's the similar technology to how they're putting in the, you know, first down markers on foot, on American football. But, they, but they've been doing those replacements for a long time. And it was a big, it's been a big, you know, people get upset about it because people sponsor for a long time, people sponsored those LEDs that went along there to get the broadcast, and then the broadcast took it away. They were like, "No, we'll, we'll, we don't get any money from that, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, we'll just replace it." And so, um, and you see that in baseball as well in the background, you know, behind the batter, those yeah. places. So yeah. they, they insert a lot of those things um, into those. Hopefully, Apple won't be as garish as a lot of folks are with those, but who knows? With yeah. this, I mean, I feel like at Apple doing ads is garish. So, well, yeah. but that, but that it. If it does show something that they could do very, very well, uh, they 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 would not want to get involved in deciding who gets to do NFL or uh, or MLB style ads. Where again, now, and now here's and now here's a very very shady uh, ad for uh, for for an investment firm. But the idea of having a having a tiled interface where you have the the live game, but you also have a tile uh, where you're inserting ads. That's something that Apple could do very very well through Apple TV and through the Apple TV Plus app. Uh, they could even we could also start to see where the line is between Apple not being involved in a filthy business because they're principled and Apple not being involved in a filthy business simply because they can't compete and they know they can't compete and they don't have a platform in which they can compete. Meaning that if they, if they had a, if they had a way to do uh, AdSense uh, like uh, with Google, the way that it could actually compete with Google and someone showed Tim Cook, the, 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 uh, the, the, the spreadsheets and the charts that said that here's how much, here's, here's how many tens of billions of dollars we would be clearing within the first three years. How principled would that stand? be so if apple decides to create their own ad network are they going to 
create the warm and fuzzy hippie crunchy version of it that says yes it's ads but it's nothing bad about ads we're not tracking information we're not tailoring things specifically to people or are they going to simply say well great now we have a swimming pool full of cash it's time to put on our speedos and dive right the hell in it's you know everybody look everybody's doing ads i have youtube tv maybe not doing ads quite that well but i watch on youtube tv i'll be watching the world series or whatever and where the cable you know the network show will go to local ads you know for our local casino and the plumber down the street youtube tv <laughs> often doesn't have anything to put there so they put like bears in a field and they say enjoy this moment of quiet like oh, wow that's <laughs> it's it's it's, it's kind of pathetic uh, I have uh, Fubo TV, and they yeah. are do they do geo targeting. I end up with oh, geo targeting. Yeah. They're not as good ads. as my my local cable company knows exactly where oh, yeah. I live, right? So, yeah. and they sell ads in the in the county region. Fubo is close enough, right? Like they'll they'll do targeted Bay Area ads that they'll right. roll in there, and that that means I guess they're using a better ad network than YouTube TV. That really, <laughs> they have like really <laughs> enjoy this moment. How of peace. is that possible? <laughs> they have birds singing and stuff. I know you'd think they'd be really good at this, and I'm sure Google thought they would be really good. Microsoft is now putting ads in Windows, uh, much to the consternation of Windows users. In fact, somebody just pointed out you now get an ad when you shut down. So it's like you can't escape. There's nowhere and I think that nowhere to go. The thing that's gonna happen is as 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 everyone just keeps on trying to add more and more and more ads, people are gonna get more and more upset about it yeah. until <laughs> people you know, don't like people, ads. You know, I know people that. you know, and, and the pro you it but what's funny is like for a lot of people, the only thing they watch in the Super Bowl is ads. Right. Like I like if the Steelers aren't playing for me, all I care about is the ads. Thing is I you're really getting the Super Bowl for free. Well, you're not really. You could be well, if you're watching broadcast, but you're, sure. you know, the kind of the feeling is, well, I'm getting this for free, so I don't mind an ad. You're getting Twit and Mac Break Weekly and all these shows for free, so I don't, you know, that's how they, that's how they pay for it. Um, but when you're paying well, for a you, service and it gives you time ads to go. In, Gives you it time gives you, to go to the bathroom, you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you, get, yeah, you get another beer, get yeah. a stock. You know, like, like when there's no, when there's no. Uh, that's ads, what I. Then no, that's the problem no. with football, soccer, and uh, F one. <laughs> you can never go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always, I always watch it on delay. That's why. So uh, you're not alone. Basic Apple guy at basicappleguy.com. I don't know who this guy is. Maybe you guys do. He's good. He's funny. He uh, he's bitching about ads and made some sample ads for products of his own in the app store like i am rich if you buy this app 999 dollars <laughs> cents. clip art casino bad graphics but good dopamine rush <laughs> black mirror casino play stupid games win stupid prizes and ghostbusters a dating site for people who have been ghosted uh <laughs> but he it's all in a way of uh shiny gem fun time it's not gambling if it's gems right uh, spreadsheets <laughs> equals some you and me all, oh. but he is actually uh, with all this humor uh, intersp interspersed talking about the the problem of this. And uh, Apple is now worth more. This week, Apple's stock was successful enough to make it worth more than Meta, Google, and Amazon combined. Meta, Google, and Amazon. Combined. If you ask somebody, if but you it, walk down the street and you said, what's the most valuable company out there? They might start with Amazon, maybe then Google, maybe then Apple. Meta obviously is worthless now. So, <laughs> but, but, but Apple's worth more than all three combined. Yeah. To, to, to be fair, Apple had some help from Mark Zuckerberg on that one. That yes. <laughs> yes. No, I agree. Meta, you could take Meta out of the equation at this point. Um, but, but the point being, they have enough money. True. Do they really need to be dipping into this, um, sewer sewage yeah. stream and i think that that's the problem is really that it, it just takes some of the sheen off of a very shiny logo you yeah. know like and, it, and, and you're just you're like do you, you do you don't need to do that like you're you're making a lot of money and you know i think that it's you know i would keep on building up the services keep on building up the you know they're they're doing a lot of things that work really well and it just feels like an un, I, I just keep feeling like it's an unforced error you yeah. know to go down yeah. this path and we've said yeah. this before. Uh, this is the quote from Basic Apple Guy. In the pursuit of more ad revenue, he's kind of echoing Marco Arman in this, ad has inflicted damage to one of its core values. I'm sorry, Apple, but great products don't come plastered with giant ads for cheese, jingles, and hookup apps. There's a lot of goodwill to be lost in the relentless pursuit of more ad revenue, and I just hope the company I've long admired realizes right. that before it's too late.
I think we all agree yeah. on that. Yeah. I think I think yeah. the the TV thing. I mean, honestly, ads during televised sports is one of those things that I don't think is a big deal. I think it's much more to start talking about placing ads in Apple Maps or wherever else, right? Like that. I think there are more and less natural places. Although I do wonder if they do an if they do a free tier of Apple TV Plus with ads, which is probably going to come. Uh, at that point, then if I pay for the no ad tier, are they still going to try to slide all these ads past me? I assume they are for like soccer, and I I don't yeah. I don't like that idea. But I, but there are places I think that are like I'm not one of those people who's like I'm just allergic to ads. I never want to see an ad anywhere. Like some ads are fine, and ads in general, it is this corrosion of like inserting ads where you're crowding out. Um, like like when between football plays or even you know on soccer matches at halftime, I'm not missing anything. No, You're not crowding out fine. good content to yeah. put ads in there and like yeah. and and it, you paid a lot of money for the MLS rights. I'm okay with that. But but on their user interfaces, when they're literally pushing things that you want to see out in order to do something kind of gross that you probably don't want to see and get it in your face. That's where it becomes really corrosive to the product. And, and uh, I feel like, and I know we talked about this last week, but like, I, I, I get this gut feeling that whoever, there's nobody there to look at the big picture and say, we need to turn away some incremental revenue because uh, the, in the long run, it hurts our product and our brand. It seems like everybody's just like, Hey, if you can make more money, Todd, uh, bring it, do whatever you need to. Here's yeah. a screen grab from uh, basic apple guy uh of the stocks app and you're you know you're looking at all this red and uh and in some of it's apple yeah the stock's going down and in the middle of it a giant display ad for a canadians crave armstrong cheese armstrong cheesy jingle <laughs> contest tell us why you love armstrong cheese and win and i have to say uh when you juxtapose this with Apple slips, even as KeyBank says sell-through remains healthy and Apple's unionization movement is at risk of losing momentum, and you see that ad, you kind of think, maybe Apple's in financial trouble, you know? Why are they putting cheesy ads well, in the middle again, of my stocks app? And again, I think that the, the problem really is, is they get Apple gets the benefit of the doubt a lot, except for AMD. Yeah. Andy doesn't give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but, but most people give them, Apple, the benefit of the doubt a lot of the time. Like, oh, they're... Their, you know, their business model is is to take care of their user. I'm not saying that they're it's altruistic. It's just that that's their business model is privacy and taking care of their users and so on and so forth. And it just doesn't feel like that's what's happening. And and once they, you know, they they say trust, you know, <laughs> trust arrives on foot and leaves on horseback. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> and they they're they're really da getting dangerously close. And I think that they're gonna. I think that they, there's a high probability they go over that where they lose a lot of that trust and it's very hard to get back. Yeah. And, and, and I, it's not so much that I had distrust of Apple. It's just that I, I could, I, I felt as though I could absolutely see how putting that, uh, putting that Johnny, I've designed uh, aluminum halo over their heads about how oh, we're not like other companies. We're not blah, 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 blah. how mm -hmm. much it's, it's always that question. How much is that? It's because we have principles and we have lines that we refuse to cross versus we just haven't figured out a way that we can monetize it. That makes sense for us. And so when you do, I, I and I'm, I'm pretty much on the same basis as most of the people in this conversation where ads are just something that, ha that, in many cases has to have to happen unless you want to pay $9 subscription fees every single month for pretty much everything you ever do. And most people do not want to do that. Uh, ads are a fact of life. And so this, this sort of thing makes it difficult for Apple to do uh, ads in a way that is that could conceivably be even uh, better uh, and more uh, respectful of people's privacy uh, than uh, than the way any other ad, ad network can do it. Now we're we're all faced. With, now we're all here having a four week conversation about it. What does this mean that Apple's considering going into advertising? Have they have they lost the faith now? So this is this is why you don't put up big huge banners again advertising yourself with a halo over your head that you yourself installed and pointing at it saying, "Hey, we're not like other people," because in the end, you are a two trillion dollar company. Yeah. You know? And they're making premium products, right? That's part of the story here is the brand. It's a premium yeah. brand. It's a clean, well-lighted place. It's a nice place to be. It's nicer than the competition. And when you get to the point where you start putting ads everywhere, you lose that. And I know, mm -hmm. I've, you know, there, there's this concept of like, well, what if they put the ads there, but you can pay to get rid of them? Well, it's like, well, that's really chintzy, right? That's like Amazon's Kindle thing where they have ads unless you pay a little extra. And it's like, I don't like that either. I don't think that sends well, the right I, message to say, you know, 
know, if you can afford it, you don't need to see ads. But other, but our default is that it's going to be junky. Like it, it, it really pushes aside the whole brand promise. I think when you start junking things up like that. I think when when you start to have it, if you have a free product and then you're charging for it, I think it makes sense. I mean, you're, then you're running ads against it. If you have a free product and then you have ads against it, I think it. I think in yeah. some ways people go, oh, that's what I get. Yeah. But I will say, as a user, if I pay for a service, I don't want ads, and then yep. I get ads, yep. I'm yep. out. The only place that I that I put up with that is is YouTube TV. You know, is the is because that's my cable. I mean, essentially my cable network. Um, and uh, but but it's because you know they're they're what are they going to put there? They're going there's going to be a gap no matter what because it's live television. So I kind of understand stand it there um and so but and, I, and it's but i i the rest of it like if i buy, i think i did hulu and hulu started putting ads in at some point they were testing it and i was like well i'm done with that well yeah i i, I do tend to see it as not the, not that the, you have to pay extra not to have you know, I, I i feel as though that's an okay deal i don't know why netflix for instance is getting absolutely such vitriolic blowback about oh that netflix promise they never do ads and now they're doing ads and now i can't use the service anymore and it's like no they're giving you a cheaper tier because they realize that obviously if people are, are sharing passwords so much it's because there are there are obstacles that maybe we can address by having a lower price tier of service and here is one way that we're going to do that to me I have actually always been grateful for Hulu's and other platforms ability to say, look, give us a few bucks more a month and you will never see an ad because I, uh, the reason why, the reason why I subscribe to YouTube red is that I just never, ever, ever want to see an ad. I'll, I will, I will deal with like embedded ads because I know that I know that these, these creators, this, this is what's helping this creator make their, make their cosplay for Halloween and, and show me this video of how they made it. But I just don't want to be given one, two, three, four ads in a row, particularly really, really, really tacky ads that make me angry uh, so it's it's a hard it's a hard line to, it's a hard line to follow and with apple it's also going to be the problem of if we if we, if i've been trained uh, since the get-go that apple services are places where i don't see ads how clear are they going to have to be that i'm looking at an ad to make sure that i'm not thinking that oh well this is just an algorithmic suggestion no this was something that was actually placed there uh for for my eyes to 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 behold it's it's a it's a tough road to go i, I don't necessarily blame apple for getting into ads because again it's here is here's a I, i've always subscribed to the big pile of money theory which is that if there is a big pile of money on a table and you tell a company that by the way there is a big pile of money here and you can take it and there's nothing illegal about it they're going to try to take that big pile of money this is what a business is in business for. But again, Apple is going to have to address some realities and do a lot of messaging to make sure that they're not aligning themselves with the very bastards that they've been beating up uh, every uh, every uh, every quarter and every year at, at uh, WWDC. And to be clear, I don't think Apple's giving our information to advertisers. But I should point out, neither does Google, neither does right. Meta. That's not how it works. That's the crown jewels. They don't give those Oh, yeah, Leo, he's uh, 66 years old and he lives in Petaluma. They don't give that information to advertisers. <laughs> what they tell advertisers is if you want to reach 66-year-old men living in Petaluma, we have 25 of them or right. whatever, and you can buy an ad for that. So, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Apple kind of, you know, muddy the waters by saying something like that. Oh, we never give your information to third parties as yeah. if that somehow... Oh, you know, make that makes it okay. But but you should be you shouldn't be worried about that. That's not the issue but, at all. But but of course, what you should be worried about is that if even if they're not sharing that information with outside parties, they're still tr an ad network has to collect that information somehow. So there's have there has to be a mode in which they are tracking you and identifying you, identifying your your movements, and trying to figure out what you're interested in, who you are, and what you're likely going to be interested in the future without even specifically seeing you uh, do uh, do a, a search in the Apple search bar uh, for uh, hardwood thousand piece puzzle pieces. They this is the the <laughs> Uh, seriously, the, the the successful ad networks get that by figuring out that oh, you've been listening to Fleetwood Mac a lot. Right. I bet he's. I bet they'd be interested they in like an old timey puzzle. <laughs> right. Yeah, and they're very good at that. They've gotten very good at that. Um, I guess you know uh, some of this um, comes from my my wish that we didn't have to fund things with advertising. I mean, we yeah. do. Uh, six colors happens because of advertising. I mean, you might you 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 know you may have a premium subscription product, but uh, you know, we have a premium I, subscription ooh. product, Chief uh, the Club Twit, and yeah, I make more money, I think, from the subscription product than I do from the ads at this point. That yeah. happened very quickly be yeah. because the ads kind of went away, and they're they're back now, but it's not the same, right? Uh, but yeah, it, it is. 
uh, that's the truth of it. And so the question is, how do you build the product? It does feel, well, feel like when we're going to streaming, right, all the streaming services, it feels like this is just the new model is in a lot of places you you can you can take a discount essentially and see ads or you can pay extra right. to not see them. And my understanding is that they make that it, that in many cases they make more money from the user who's paying extra than they do from the users who are seeing ads. And as long as that's so, the case, companies will be more motivated to do oh. that. But, you know. So if that were the yeah, case here, I would not have ads. I mean, but we just, well, the, we don't, the club, as, as wonderful as the club is and as active as our members are, they don't really cover... And, anywhere near the 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 nut we have we have a three and a half sure. million dollar a year well, and, and, nut I, there's no way they, they're covered and, not, and and your whole audience isn't going to pay that's the other part of it yeah it's do, a fraction the, of the it's audience. that premium that's right. model right that's yeah. which which is you know uh, we give it away with ads and if you want to pay to not see the ads you can do that too and it's not a bad uh, it's not a bad model it's just you know it depends on what your product is every product is different well, when well, i started also, the network i really wanted it to be a customer i didn't want to do ads for three years i resisted it mm -hmm. um, and, and but it's, just it's couldn't it's, grow without the ads Alex? it's it's also a scalability issue for streaming companies because you know i can like the, the problem you end up with um for a lot of streaming is that I'm getting $8 a month from you or $20 a month from you or $15 a month from you. I don't get more money because you watched it more. It just eats, you know, bits aren't free. Those bits that take the video from their server to your house, there are tolls on the way there. And if, and if we start to push that, you know, so one of the advantages of advertising admittedly is that, is that you are, if you're generating revenue from the content that goes out, so it's cash positive, if it gets to the person, you're hoping that that you're you're making money on their interaction with that, those bits, as opposed to it being a flat fee, you know, um, because yeah. it, it is, it's not a significant number uh, per, you know, per minute, but it's, it adds up when we you have millions or I hundreds of millions of people I watching. I don't think, maybe Lisa has, she's super smart, but I don't think we've calculated the seven bucks uh, a month versus the ad revenue we get like are we replacing if you pay me seven bucks and of course patreon takes a couple of them but so let's say we make five bucks a user are you worth five bucks to the ad in our ad supported network and i don't i mean i figure it's probably something like that but it's uh, i don't know i, I really don't yeah. know and you're right and then the you know if you watch every single one of our shows <laughs> the model for the model for uh uh podcasting is is more like magazines than it is the model for broadcasting broadcasting a broadcaster puts out a signal in the old days right and it doesn't matter how many people listen it doesn't cost them more every single download costs money yeah. so it's a complicated equation to be honest thank god i have somebody who knows spreadsheets <laughs> <laughs> me too oh man i'd hate to have to figure this out um, I do know, I mean, one of the things that we're coming up against uh, is a big crunch uh, for next year. We don't, I don't think we will be able to cover our expenses. And there's no magical pot of gold that we can pull pull the expenses from. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think of the best, and the best, I, what I, I'm looking a little bit, what's really interesting happening right now in front of our eyes is this, what's this uh, problem, this dumpster fire that's going on at Twitter and the mass migration, more than a million people have left Twitter to go to Mastodon, which is a, a un, there's no ad support. It's, it's a, it's a distributed social network. We have one twit social, which until this migration cost me 15 euros a month. <laughs> so it was nothing right now I have to pay at least a hundred bucks a month. And I'm, and, it, and as it continues, I'm gonna have to pay more and more and more. Um, and yet I think it's superior in every respect to Twitter because it is ad free, uh, and it's kind of locally moderated. So it has a local, more local, um, tone to it and things like that. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice if we could just do everything that way, you know? Um, but even Microsoft feels like, like Apple, like mm -hmm. every other tech company, we got to supplement our income with ads. Yeah. Is that great or is that necessary? 
It's it's necessary. It, it wasn't. It, it's within living memory, certainly. That the big question was, oh my God, Apple, you're having so much success with the iPhone. But if <laughs> there there again, BlackBerry was a huge was a huge manufacturer until they got tanked. Uh, <laughs> Nokia was a huge manufacturer until they got tanked. What happens if someone comes along and tanks the iPhone business? The the ability of Apple to do exactly what they want to do, including work on self driving cars, including work on VR AR headsets is based on their ability to simply tell stockholders, hey, if you don't like what we're doing, sell your stock. I'm sure they will buy it from you and they're all the people who will buy it as well. And so if they if they leave money on the table when they're trying to transact at that at the level in which they're trying to transact, that's almost wrong for them to do. It'd be wrong if they did it in a very unethical and skeevy way. But I don't begrudge them for saying, look, here is a way we can make tens of billions of dollars by simply walking up to this table with an empty pillowcase and a rake. Yeah, it's a very, I feel like we're going through an interesting, um, well, in many, many, many ways, an interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of juncture in uh, in history. <laughs> the internet has clearly mixed everything up, and uh, and I think Apple is probably like every company just trying to figure out, why did they raise the cost a few bucks on Apple One and things like that? Not because it, is it because it costs them more? Um, it, it is two things, right? The TV, it's, they say it's because they're spending more money on TV output, so they want to make more money there to fund that. Uh, for music, they say it's entirely the, that, the, the um, yeah. that the licensing went up, and so the yeah. labels want more money. And the way they say that, it's hilarious. They, they basically are like, yeah, we got to pay the labels money, but at least some of that goes to the artists. Eh. But for the TV, it's just they're spending a lot of money on TV, and they... they I, and they intentionally underpriced it, right? Because they were going to launch with very little content, and they've got more now, and they've got aspirations, so they're spending more. Part of the problem is it's opaque. So, yeah. uh, and that's the yeah. whole problem with inflation is is uh, you know who's who's raising prices because they can, who's raising prices because they have to, and it's not it's a completely opaque. We just don't know. We just don't know. And so then that lends your mind to wander. Hey, here's an interesting email thread. <laughs> this comes from a Twitter account called Internal Tech Emails, a battle between Eddie Q, Phil Schiller, and Craig Federighi over the direction of messages on Android. Now, I should point out this is nine years ago. Eddie, and I, I, I'm, I am presuming that these are genuine they come from according to this uh, twitter account from discovery in you know a variety of trials and it kind of makes sense eddie q wrote we really need to bring iMessage to android this is because uh, of a rumor published in apple insider that google is going to buy whatsapp i have had a couple of people investigating this but we should go full speed and make this an official product google will instantly own messages with this acquisition this actually makes me wonder why Google didn't buy WhatsApp because Google has basically ceded the messaging world to a <laughs> bunch of crap. Uh, to which, let's see, what's, let's see. The first message is 9.08 p.m. You know, these guys have a work ethic. To which, uh, 18 minutes, 28 minutes later, uh, Phil Schiller replies, and since we make no money on iMessage, what will be the point? To which Eddie responds half an hour after that, do we want to lose one of the most important apps in a mobile environment to Google? They have search, mail, free video, growing quickly in browsers. Yes, they now dominate. We have the best messaging app, and we should make it the industry standard. I, you know, I kind of agree. I don't know what ways we can monetize it, but it doesn't cost us a lot to run. Who are you rooting for at this point, Eddie or Phil? <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for Eddie. To yeah. which Craig Federighi the next morning at 7 a.m. pipes in. Do you have any thoughts about how we would make switching to iMessage from WhatsApp compelling to masses of Android users who don't have a bunch of iOS friends? iMessage is a nice app service, but to get users to switch social networks, we'd need more than a marginally better app. That's why Google's willing to pay a billion dollars for the network, not for the app. Well, that's a very good point. In absence of a strategy to become the primary messaging service for a bulk of cell phone users, I am concerned the iMessage on Android would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. We saw, this now kind of validates this, because we did see that last sentence 
all over the news when it came out in the uh, battle with Epic. Um, and now we see the context uh, of it. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I don't. I, I don't blame Apple for not doing an uh, an, an iMessage client. Uh, it would be an immense amount of work, an immense amount of support. Uh, as uh, as as they said in the, in the thread, how do we monetize this? How do we support all these users? And we remember that the Android is actually the the lion's share of the mobile market. Um, I won't. We won't get into the argument again. I just wish that the Apple would would take more steps to make the conversations between iPhone users and Android users much better and much richer, much more safe, uh, better pictures, better, uh, better uh, videos, better everything. And I think they could do that by simply switching from without having to switch to uh, switch to messages for, uh, for, for, from Google, but simply say, look, our, our right now, our fallback when you're not talking to an iMessage user is SMS. Now we're going to use RCS. And if RCS isn't there, then we switch back to SMS. But yeah, I don't, I, I it would have been a great thing, I think. And I think that if, if they knew exactly what a hash that, uh, that Google was going to make out of messaging over for the next six years, they would have relaxed. I mean, every, I mean, exactly. I mean, every honestly. So, so official, officially, uh, officially, Hangouts was killed. Like it was already announced, but it was officially killed. And I always remember myself that every time that every time that Google cancels like another messaging platform, it's time for me to check the batteries, my smoke detectors. So there's there is something good that comes out of that indecision. But yeah, I don't. I, I'm I'm okay with them not having a, a, an iMessage compatible app. I just think that there are few excuses for them not supporting an open standard that yes, one that Google has provided but one that will actually make a better experience between their iPhone users and their, and the Android community. Alex thoughts on that email exchange. I, you know, I, I think that it was, I, I guess I would say that, you know, you just saw the context context of, of them thinking through that process. I think that that, that email or the, that one comment at the end was um, makes much more sense and is less powerful in context, in context of the rest of the conversation, exactly. yeah. you know, so I think that, I think we, it, you know, it stood out a lot when it was just cut out and that's what all you saw when you see the overall conversation, it, it, it is just one, one comment in a lot of reasonable things. I think that iMessage would be, it'd be really hard for Apple to, I think it's, it, it has the most to do with just innovation. You, you have to keep on, you know, the reason Apple can build an M1 um, is because they own everything, you know, they, they can't, you know, and the reason that Intel will have a hard time is because they don't own everything. And so if you want to keep on moving a technology forward, you, you know, if you're small, you want to, uh, you, you can't do what Apple's doing because you can't, you can't grab on, you know, like no one's going to pay attention to you. But once you're big, there's a, a lot of advantages to being by yourself and not having to deal with other people's needs and other, what other people want to do with your product and being able to have your, all your teams just kind of work together and make all of those things integrate, especially if, oh, we want to put AR into this. We want to put this into this want, and, and not have, and just say, listen, like we're going to focus a hundred percent on this. The other stuff is we'll send you texts, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, you know, and, and so, and, 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 and we got that working, but then, you know, uh, with no company, is it, is it unlimited resources? I mean, there are a certain number of really good programmers that are out there. And, um, and so they, you know, where are they going to put those folks to handle all of those problems? And you hear it all the time about companies taking this team and moving them over here because they needed to get something fixed. You know, it's that, that tells you that it's not just about, uh, available people. I mean, it's, they, they have to find the right people to do that. And so I think that, uh, I don't think Apple would make any more money with it. I don't think that they, I think that they would not be able to innovate the way that they, uh, want to. And I, and, you know, so I, I think that it makes sense for Apple to just stick with building for their own platforms. I mean, they, they, I, I think as an, I don't think that their users, I think if you asked Apple users, not Android users, but Apple users, is it important for you, for Apple to develop for the Android platform? I would argue probably somewhere between 90 and 99% would say, nope. <laughs> you know, like so, so, it, yeah. so, so an Apple is going to look at what 90% of their pop, what 90% of their audience that wants 90% of the time, you know, and, and there's not, there's no, there, just, I don't know Apple users that I know a lot of Apple users like me that will text less to people who have green, <laughs> green bubbles because it means it's not on everything. Like it's, it, for me, it's like, Oh, I don't, I got to go find the phone that is connected to that thing. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, so I think that's a, a little bit of a thing, but, but none of us would want to give up forward momentum on any innovation to include the Android platform. So I, I think that that's a very small, uh, maybe, maybe vocal on Twitter or whatever, but a very, very tiny percentage of users, uh, really care. Mm -hmm. But how do you feel so about, 
but how do you feel about support for RCS? If you if you ask the Apple users, hey, you know how like your your brother and your aunt when they send you pictures, they look like crap compared to uh, the pictures that you get when, from uh, from your sister. Would you like those pictures to be better? Would you like the the video they sent you to be better? They would probably say yes. And when I, the answer is well, they Apple could do that without sacrificing innovation, without having to create a new they would uh, a new app. They would absolutely sacri no, sacrifice sacrifice innovation. Absolutely. No, anytime no, you incorporate would. another anytime you incorporate another platform in another protocol you give up innovation like that is an absolute i mean as someone who's done this many many times anytime you you add another platform that you have to support you're now spending resources on something instead of moving forward you have to go well will this product work in in over here as well as over here you know and so there is you would absolutely get so the the question really is are you willing to get less out of iMessages over time you know because we because you you want to get better photos from your cousin you know and the answer again would be probably no 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 one care like apple apple okay. users don't care about about android users like they just don't care okay, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I will i will, I will say that i'm 100% certain that you're 100% wrong okay okay about, we should do about, a poll sometime about how, we should about get about someone about about how would about, about about how it would it would it would hold back Apple innovation. The 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 the, the, the general response I have to things like that are that a company the scale of Apple can do truly whatever it wants to do, whatever no, it thinks is a priority. It, it, they can. Best, see, I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm, and I, I feel as though if they can if they can create all these projects and fund all these projects that they're working on right now that are speculative in nature uh some of which have succeeded some of which we don't have failed some of which we don't know whether it's going to succeed or fail i think that this simple thing of not only giving a better experience for iphone users who talk to people who are not necessarily an iphone uh, uh using iphones and also giving them a more secure experience i think that that's absolutely worth it and the last thing being that i, I think that i think it's dramatic that you say that there are people that like it, it limits your it's, it, it limits how much you want to talk to people who are quote green bubbles unquote quote that is the smoking gun that is the reason for if i if i were if i were higher up at apple and i and i were hearing users talk about things like that and i hear about that a lot i would say okay well we at least have to improve this experience for for these people to make sure that they are still talking to their whole community of people their their user their users aren't clamoring uh, you know pure apple users aren't sitting at the door clamoring like if we only had rcs i mean they just they just don't care like they don't they're not, they're, like you, yeah. you i think don't, most don't, users don't know which is why yeah, Andy posed it that way, though, as a question about an but experience, it, 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 right? I've worked, in, I've worked in so many engineering teams, and I can just tell you, like, so, for instance, I, I did a lot of stream, I do a lot of streaming. We added Android and Windows to some of this platform stuff that we were doing. It was like being thrown into a hot pit of tar. <laughs> like, 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 you know, and so the thing is, is that it is every time we add a protocol, especially with basically substandard platforms like Android and Windows, you get, you get thrown into there and all the, all the services, all the services that you're, that like, cause when we built the, when we built the app that I built, the, it was, we, we built it only for the Apple platform first because I just wanted it to work and three months it's fine. It's working perfectly. The, the, everything. And, and really within the first three weeks it was working. Um, and it's a very complicated app. We, we, then we add Android and Windows and a year later. It's not, it's not really working, you know? And, and so the thing is, is that it, it is, it, it's just their, their protocols are just trash, you know? And so the thing is, is that is the dealing with their the goofiness about how they do those things is so frustrating that I would never, as a user, knowing what that means on the other side of, of supporting something that Google builds, I would never touch that. I would never, I would never I'd be like, no, no, like any app. I, I won't build, I won't build Android and Windows apps anymore after that experience because it was just such a horrible experience, you know? Yeah. Well, just uh, again, we're not talking about building uh, Android and Windows apps. We're talking about supporting a protocol. And also the thing that, is that's, that it's not a standard. It's, it's not a standard. Look, it's, well, it's kind it of a standard, standard, isn't it? It's uh, quasi, uh, yeah. The carrier is now all supported. But the other thing is that, so if you were the, if you were in charge of Safari, you'd say that, no, no, we're not going to support this protocol for uh, local storage. No, we're not going to support this certificate protocol. We want to build our own certificate protocol. Like Apple does this all the time on the Safari team, and it doesn't seem to, it, the things when that hold Safari small. back are actually Apple. 
Well, that's the kitty cat principle. The kitty cat principle is that that your cat is really nice to you as long as it's small and you're big. As soon as it's big, <laughs> it would eat you in a heartbeat. You know, that's like true. you know, and and so, <laughs> so the thing is, that. is that when you're when, when you're when you're uh, when you're a little when you're a little in a market, then you do what you need to do to live in that market. When you're big in that market, you don't you only do what you what you have to do. <laughs> like you know, this, oh, it doesn't help yeah. you to do that process. That, and so so that that also doesn't make again, I, Apple look good. Saying if we, Apple was sending getting tons we care, we, we, we care. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. Go ahead. Well, I want to interrupt say is, and say, yeah, I think you both sure. have made your points. Good points. Okay, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I agree. We I think, should also mention, by the way, that uh, we're talking about almost entirely a North America centric approach here because in most of the world, else uses people don't use. Yeah. yeah, they don't use iMessage at all. It's really only in the U.S. Right. where that is taken up at all. I, you know, I'm going to come in the middle here and say I think Apple should probably support RCS because I think it would make the iPhone user experience better because iPhone users have to deal with people who have Android phones and that experience is not very good and they should make it a little bit better. It can still be a green bubble. It can still not support all the features. It can still not sell and say it's as good as iMessage, but it would be, I would argue, a better user experience for iPhone users to not have quite as much of a mess when they're trying to do a, like a group conversation and there are people on there who are using Android phones and all of that. At the same time, I think Craig Federighi is absolutely right, which is you know, iMessage is is part of Apple's lock-in strategy. It is a feature that Apple has built for people in its ecosystem to differentiate itself from others, and it worked. And well, it's and, not a public utility. And so and I don't think that extending <laughs> iMessage elsewhere makes any sense. But I do actually agree with Andy. I think that Apple could make iPhone users' lives better by supporting RCS instead of SMS. Because keep in mind, Apple's already supporting a weird carrier centric yeah. text SMS is messaging as as standard it yeah. it's just one from decades ago right. they could probably <laughs> put a little bit, a bit of effort in there to make it a little bit better for people who are in these heterogeneous uh you know messaging conversations without undercutting iMessage and and, and I will admit to, to to the point that was made earlier my son found you know got got an android phone um <laughs> I got one message from it and I bought him an iPhone. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, like, there you go. Like, yeah, there you go. No, no, I don't want that. My I don't, daughter, I'm not going to have someone. My daughter someone is have 30, so I don't have a choice time. and she will yeah. not use iPhones. And we message almost every day. And it, mm -hmm. for the most part, it's it's fine, especially now that reactions get translated properly. And, you know, if it, I send her a, a Memoji, it just shows up on her phone as an image that I sent her. I don't, I don't think it's the end of the world. And we and, have group and, chats that she's a part of. And the rest are iPhone users, and it, it all seems to work. So I don't, I don't think it's. I don't think most users are are in a lot of pain, but maybe they are. I don't see why you couldn't just add RCS. What really gratified me reading that full thread for the first time, because uh, we kind of saw parts and pieces of it in the in the spring, is that that discussion is going on inside Apple, and I think in a civilized and intelligent way. And I understand Eddie Q saying, you know, this could be bad if if Google buys. WhatsApp turned out interestingly <laughs> Meta bought it I don't know it wasn't as bad if Meta bought it I don't know I guess because Google has the phones um, right and I think that a lot of us are so uh, using so many messaging apps now I think exactly. that's the other thing that's going yeah. on is that I'm I mean 80 percent maybe 90 percent of my interactions are in discord like I don't if, like I, if, that's if that's our I have family group messages with my daughter were a problem, we would just move to somewhere. We would move to Telegram mm -hmm. or to WhatsApp, or, and it's not. But we right. haven't, and so my th thinking is, I guess it's it's working fine. It's working uh, good okay. enough. Hey, what about this? <laughs> Actually, let me take a break, and then I'll ask you <laughs> if we need the word "hey." <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's for horses. Hey, it's for horses, my friend, as my fourth grade teacher would say. Uh, this show brought to you today by a well-rested chief twit because I have my cozy eight sleep. I tell you, as it gets colder and colder, I am more and more. I even said this to Lisa last night. Thank you, eight sleep, because we had the, it was it was freezing and we didn't have to turn the heat on in the house. We just had our eight sleep pod cover on our bed go up to ten. And we were toasty warm all night. In fact, I, I I will admit one of the reasons I was late for the show today is because I didn't want to get out of bed because it was so cozy in there. Eight sleep is awesome. Cool when it needed to be cool, warm when you need it to be warm. It's the only way to make your bed both warm and cool. 
with the uh, pod cover, or by the way, they sell a mattress too. We like our mattress, so we just we we put the eight sleep pod on top of it, like it's like a fitted sheet. But then what's cool is it dynamically cools or heats each side of the bed separately to maintain the optimal sleeping temperature for what your body needs. So you can go as cool as fifty five, or as hot as one hundred and ten. Which, both of which are noticeable, right? But, boy, when it was really hot in the summer, the worst thing in the world is to wake up in the middle of the night sweating hot and uncomfortable, right? In fact, it turns out that is the number one complaint people have in, in sleeping poorly is it's too hot. But with eight sleep, it's monitoring the room temperature. It's monitoring you and how you're tossing and turning and whatever, and adjusting the temperature dynamically throughout the night. I always start warm. It cools it off as I go into my deepest sleep, which helps. Me. Apparently, I didn't realize this, but it really helps you sleep more deeply. And then it's almost an alarm function. I say, okay, I want to wake up at 830, and it starts warming it up. And actually, I wake up very naturally. It's warm and it's cozy. This holiday season, give the never-ending gift of better Sleep. Consistent good sleep can reduce the likelihood of serious health issues, decrease the risk of heart disease, lower your blood pressure, even reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. And you'll fall asleep in record time because you're so cozy, <laughs> so comfy. Clinical data shows eight sleep users experience 34% more deep sleep. And I will, I will vouch for that. I know when I've had a good night's sleep and I, if I look at my eight sleep stats and I see, oh yeah, you got an hour and a half deep sleep, you know, even 50% more deep sleep makes a huge difference. I feel, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm moving better. My physical recovery is better. My hormone regulation, my mental clarity. It's not a holiday miracle. It sounds like one, this would be a great holiday gift for your family. If better sleep is on your wish list, look no farther than the new pod Three, they've actually doubled the sensors, so they 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 are even more accurate. And I, oh, I mean, especially now that it's getting cold in the winter, cold and damp, and I just, and we don't, and and literally we don't, you know. And I don't like to heat the house at night because then it gets too hot in the middle of the night. Right, it's warm at first, but then it's too. Hot. This is perfect. It just does it for you. It saves me money on on heating the house. I just heat our our comfy bed. Lisa has a different, you know, she likes it a lot hotter. I have a little, I like it to be a little cooler, but that's fine. We each get our own settings. For a limited time, Eight Sleep is offering you. Whoa, stand back! F up to four hundred dollars off their Sleep Fit Holiday Bundle. That includes what we have the pod cover. We have the pod two. They have now the pod three, but that includes the pod cover. Go to eightsleep.com/macbreak to get the exclusive holiday savings. 8sleep currently ships within the US, Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU and Australia. 8sleep e i g h t sleep.com/macbreak but go right now cuz this offer ends November 30th. After November 30th, same URL, check out the pod cover. There probably might be other holiday savings cuz it's, you know, still the holiday season, but you'll save at least $150 at checkout with our normal offer. But right now, up to $400 on the Sleep Fit Holiday Bundle. So this is something you, you really want to check out right now. You've probably heard me talk about it. You heard Kevin Rose tell me about it two years ago. Amy Webb on this, uh, heard about it on the show. She got it uh, six months later. She told me, oh, you got to get this thing. I, I was slow. I've, we've had it now for a little more than a year. I, I, when we travel, I go, where's my eight sleep? You need it. 8sleep.com slash MacBreak. In fact, if the only thing I would say to 8sleep is, can you make a portable one so I can take it to the hotels? <laughs> it would really be nice. 8sleep.com slash MacBreak. Thank you, 8sleep, for your support of our show. Tom in our uh, chat room said, but I like the ads uh, you guys do. Because, yeah, we try to pick sponsors that we use and like. Uh, and can and we always very careful to make sure it's something we can uh, say, you know, we can recommend. So. I guess some ads aren't the end of the world, but yeah, I want that one now. I went after the show last week and went to the Eight Sleep website. I was like, "Oh, tell me more it's about this." So nice. <laughs> I am not. This is not me making something well, up. Tell I'm, Lisa. Tell Lisa that I need one. How about that? Just, oh, yeah, let, yeah. let her know. We all we'd all like one. All, all, Christmas oh, present. Oh, 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 that's a great idea. I spend this ad like looking at the site. I know. Going, we all have to share the same oh, bed, so though. It's going to be what happens. It's a little pricey. It's I understand. Three, it's three not, men in a bed. Yeah. I know. You guys, know. we're going to send you one eight sleep for the three of you. You can work yeah. that out. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a real Charlie and the Chocolate Factory situation going on there. Sleep head to toe. That's all I'm saying. Just sleep head go. to toe. Yeah. I dip, I dip big spoon. <laughs> so uh, Mark Gurman says, I don't know. I don't know. Do I don't know how seriously to take this. Apple is working to remove hay from Hey Siri. That'll um, solve it. That'll solve And by the way, they say this might take, it might not happen next year. Might take till 2024. Well, first of all, what? <laughs> well, in fact, you know, can I make a suggestion? Apple, take all that engineering time and make it so that we can have a custom phrase, which I had on my 2013 Moto X phone. Because I got to tell you, yeah. Siri's waking up. I'll watch a show. I live in a very hostile environment because I have I have Google Assistant, Amazon's Echo, and Siri. Oh, and Sonos too. And so there's always some machine talking back to the TV almost all the time. It's annoying. <laughs> and then you yell at it and says, "What? I couldn't hear you. What can I do for you? What would?" You? It's like no. So taking the hay off seems like the wrong direction. Yeah. On my That's moto, on my moto, I had the wake up was help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> and that works great because it was very rarely heard in the real world. Also, eight eight syllables. You're not the an AI yeah. is not going to mistake that for anything else. It's it sounds like I'm making a joke by saying, "Ooh, that uh, turns from three syllables into two. But that actually is a very very significant increase in the in the problem of separating an intentional uh, an intentional uh, command from something that was just part of another word that was that was said. Um, like uh, Google, for instance, uses the uh, has been doing a lot of that kind of stuff uh, in trying to simplify the, the access to the Google Assistant. But a lot of that is powered not just with uh, AI, but also with uh, here is a smart speaker that can kind of sense if someone is in the room or not and sense if they are face if, if that if the if the source of the of the command is being directed towards this microphone or not. Oh, it's and totally so smart about that. In fact, I have yep. to edge towards the bathroom if I want the bathroom speaker to respond when I say, hey, you know who? Hey, Google. Uh, uh, instead of the bedroom one, because if the bedroom response is not as good as speaker, so I will actually literally face the other way and take a couple of steps towards yeah. the bathroom and say, "No, this one's for you," which is ridiculous. Yeah, like especially when you consider. Is. Well, especially when you consider that Apple doesn't let you specify that look, when I when I when I introduce a new like, Google device that's activated for the assistant, and I, the first time I give it a command, I will my, one of my devices, my phone, my whatever, will say, "Hey," uh, will actually say, uh, "Did the correct device respond to your command? What what should this device be doing when it hears a command like that?" Whereas Apple devices don't have that kind of capability, so it becomes it becomes really really complicated. I wish them well with it. It's it, it does make it more personable because I don't. It, uh, as we joked around like, "Hey, is for horses," but it, it is a subtle hey, thing that we hey. don't necessarily say. Yeah. Hey, Leo. No. Well, and no. so I have I, the Amazon Echo. Uh, you can have uh, an, a, a broad range of trigger words. It could be Echo. Yeah. It could be computer. It can be A L E X A. Uh, and you can add voices. So I have Melissa. I can have Hey Melissa. I can have Hey Samuel. Um, so and I can have Ziggy. So the one in my office is Ziggy. But if I forget to, if I don't say Hey Siri, it will think Ziggy will think. If I say Ziggy Siri, so sometimes both of them answer because they're so yeah. Siri and Ziggy are so close together. So just make it uh, more customizable. Longer is better. Apple's saying no, no, no. We we don't we want to make it shorter because then it's more efficient. That seems like the wrong. Am I alone in this? No, I think we'll get a lot more. Mm -hmm's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You know, this is, or, the, this is feels like I'm the sorry, wrong direction. Can't. Yeah, I mean, we our TV is in the same room as the as oh, uh, one of the home pods. Yeah, it's not constant, but it is weird. It'll be like, and it's usually some quiet part of the movie, and you're in there, and suddenly you go, I, I don't understand what you just. Yeah, yeah. my Amazon Echo. My Amazon Echo does that all the time. Yep. And, uh, you know, it is, again, a three-syllable uh, trigger I, phrase, and it does it all the time, and it starts talking to itself. I, I actually find that the Echo does it more than the HomePod does. Well, it definitely did it more than my race. house because of my name. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Well, you yeah, can change, here's the name. thing, though. You can change the wake word in should, Amazon's ecosystem, been. and you can't Ziggy's in Apple's, good. and that's a problem. Right. Yeah, Ziggy's good. Yeah. I like Ziggy. 
Um, but again, Ziggy's a lot like Siri, so don't put them next to each other because they get confused. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mm, I, I feel like I feel like we're going the wrong direction. That's all I can say, Apple. And I don't know why it takes a year and a half to change it from hey to just drop in the hey. Why does that it's, take it, so it, long? I, I, I do think that's a non-trivial problem. I just they say I that. just hope that this is. I, I just hope that this isn't a case where they. They have a long list of priorities and they could choose chosen any of them. And this is the one they chose to focus on. I'm sure that's not the situation, but it's like when I think about the complaints that I have uh, about about Shlomo, it's never about, oh, I just I just I'm by the time I get to the actual command. But after saying three syllables to activate it, my, my mouth is parched. I, I lose my <laughs> brain of thought. It's like, no, I, it's like, please, be, please be smarter. Please don't say when I when I ask you to do something that you've done like two or three times before here, here's information about turn on the bedroom lights. For from Wikipedia, like no, that's really now playing. Turn on the bedroom lights from fraudulent bands. Like no, I I really think you know what I want you to do, yeah. Shlomo. Just uh, Ming Chi Kuo, the other rumor guys uh, saying now that Apple's VR glasses could be pushed back to as late as 2025 or 2026 amid design issues. Wow. Mm. Well, yeah. I mean, I think isn't the core question of this product always been what is the right time to the end, enter the market? And then I feel like Apple that they have their track record is actually pretty good, right? Where they don't really release a product until they can make an impact. And one of the rumors has been that this product that's supposed to come next year is going to cost, you know, two thousand twenty five hundred dollars. And, you know, is it going to be good enough is it going to be a, a real product or is that going to be purely aspirational? And I felt like in general, Apple doesn't like to re release purely apps, aspirational products, right? They want to, they want to sell product. They want to send, sell millions of products. And uh, this, this might, the positive way to take this is maybe somebody inside Apple finally looked at this product and said, why are we releasing it now? Uh, our only competition is Meta. We've seen Meta's thing now. It's fine. It's not going to change the world. We've <laughs> got time to make a product that is not because if they release a product and it's a loser, right? Like, uh, sorry, Newton fans, but like the Newton, right, right. they did it too soon. <laughs> right. They did it too soon right. and they couldn't come back from it. it wasn't ready. And I yeah. think that there is a great amount that Apple has historically exercised of, uh, of self limitation to say we're not ready some discipline to say this product is not up to our standards and if that's what's happening here then i say great right because i don't want that overpriced vr product that is kind of a loser uh you know apple devoting time to that if it's not ready it shouldn't ship and and i think that there's still ground to be laid before you know groundwork to be laid before the before you actually put out the device so one of the big problems that all of these that all of the products so far come out is that there just isn't enough content, you know, and there's not enough to do with it. And I think that, you know, Apple has done a pretty good job with reality, you know, um, you know, a lot of the reality ki um, kits, you know, the um, converter and the, you know, and, and so on and so forth to make that work. But there's a lot more that can be done for, and I still think and I, that adding USDZ to Keynote will make a huge difference in how much content, sheer content is available that eventually goes into AR and can go into AR almost immediately. So, you know, the thing is, is that um, when Keynote and the Office apps suddenly have what we already have in messages, which is I can send you a model, you click on it and it immediately shows up at scale in front of you, ready to go. Um, you know, that it, it changes the, the size of the market that 3D models live in by 100x. And what suddenly happens, like what we're seeing with spatial audio, when Apple released spatial audio to music, suddenly everybody is trying to remix all of their albums into spatial. And, you know, in, in L.A. and New York, they're just it's just gangsters. I mean, like, like you know, just it's just going crazy. Um, and so of trying to get all of that to, 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 to capture that market. And if you see um, when they add the, and the reason you would use the 3D models is you think about all that clip art. Clip art being, what if, what if the clip art can be exactly what you want? What if it can rotate around? What if you can, even if you're not going to use the 3D, you can rotate that phone to be exactly where you wanted it. You can put something else in the 3D thing and then let it go. And then it's just in the slide, but it's no longer, you no longer have to find photos on iStock. You know, you literally have photo real objects that are, that you're putting into your presentations um, and into your pages, documents, and even into numbers. I don't know why you would do that, but they'll do it all at the same time, I'm sure. 
Um, but that market suddenly becomes massive and all these, all these products get made, you know, for it, those products happen to be very useful. Um, and it helps standardize the market on, on one, three platform, which would be useful for Apple. So let me, uh, and, let me correct myself. It's not Ming-Chi Kuo. It's Jeff Poo, who is an analyst at High Tong International Tech Research. I, I misquoted. Yeah. So that was a different but, analyst, same, yeah. same information. But this is all good conversation. There's a uh, there's an engineer who I think still works at Google uh, by the name of Warren Craddock, who posted a very interesting thread on Twitter a couple months ago, uh, starting off with uh, he, he worked on the Lytro uh, Lightfield camera. He worked on Google Glass. He also worked on the Google Clips, like that little clip on camera that automatically takes pictures uh, and, and puts it onto Google Photos for you. And he's had so many interesting things to say about how uh uh, development teams can continue to go forward because they're convinced that the technology is really cool. They can convince themselves that this is going to find its purpose and ignore like the biggest problems with it, specifically with Google Glass. Uh, he said uh, Google Glass actually had two fatal flaws. Number one, it didn't really do anything very useful. And two, you looked stupid while wearing it. Uh, but the culture in Google, and the, on the team, like, ignore those those flaws they tried to they tried to come up with a reason for them to for, for it to exist they couldn't so they released it to developers hoping that developers would come up with a reason for people want to to, to want to use google glass even the developers failed to find that reason but the the the, in, the internal thinking that no, no no there has to be something here there has to be something here and we've and possibly that we've just invested too much of our of our faith in this too much of our innovation into this to simply admit that this was a bad idea to begin with so if uh, or, this I mean, this is this, this, this isn't a really, really, really uh, uh, thorough sort of rumor to investigate, but I would not be at all disappointed to learn that any company that's working on real effective, uh, real effective AR VR is delaying three or four years, if only to decide that, hey, let's wait for this, this new display technology to mature. Let's wait until we can manufacture it for less than a thousand dollars and or let's 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 not try to start. To, let's not try to, uh, to sell boats in uh, in Nebraska. Uh, let's wait for our market to let, let's let's try to sell boats in Rhode Island. Let's try to sell boats in, in Florida. Let's wait for them to be a market for this thing before we decide to try to say, hey, yes, if if you had a large body of water, this would be a wonderful way to travel across it. It doesn't exist yet. But hey, maybe we'll create one because they're so popular now. I've been playing with the uh, Quest Pro, the sixteen hundred dollar meta thing. Yeah. Actually, uh Micah just stole it from me. He's, I may never see it again <laughs> because he had the quest too. And I wanted, and I said, you know, give this a try. It's, it's actually really fun, but it's not a world changing product. And, and, and Meta is trying to uh, make it more of a productivity tool. And there is more AR capability because now you have color pass through. So you can, you know, have your desktop floating in your real world. But it's not that compelling of a product. I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Jason. I, I wonder, I mean, Andy's absolutely right. The, it, I'll throw in there also there's the corporate chess game, right? Which is like mm. we need to build this product because our comp competitors are building this product and we need to stop them. And that is not necessarily a reason to have a product. And like I said, Apple historically has been pretty good with the discipline here. But, uh, yeah, I also wonder when you talk about technologies and component technologies, you've got a whole team of people working on this product. I wonder if they get to the point where they say, okay, we have tried out this new emerging technology that it's not going to be able to be mass produced at the price that we want for another year or two. And it's a game changer. And, and I could also see them making, and I don't know what that technology is, but I could see the people inside making the argument, we don't have to launch this now. Mm -hmm. And if we do, yeah. this other thing is going to make it irrelevant in a year or two. So let's wait. And again, historically, and today's Apple is different from historic Apple, but historically Apple has shown great restraint and said, we're, we're going to move at, at the right time when the right tech is there for our first generation product to be, yeah, a first generation product, but but pretty good and a, and a good start and not a step back, but a step forward. And I wonder if that is happening here. I'll also yeah. point out, just to throw it in there, the Apple car rumors we've been talking about for a million years now. <laughs> I, I take that as a sign of a healthy company that they spent a lot of money on that and not done a product because there's no product there, at least not yet. I think that that's a good sign. So I'm not saying that like, I hope that this product doesn't come out next year. I'm just saying like, if it doesn't, I, I suspect it's because they have had the discipline to say, it's just not time. It's just yeah, not our yeah. time for this product. It might even be fully ready, fully made, but it's yeah. just not the right time. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I remember well, the they look at the price 
and they say, forget it, nobody's going to buy this because it's just, we can't, we got to get the price down further or we got to get this feature uh, and it's cost too much right now. I mean, it could be some very simple, I, I and I'll throw out there, I wouldn't put it past them at some point to do if they have a product that's sort of ready to go and they're not going to do it to at some point, maybe do like a developer kit or something that is actually that hardware, but to sell it to the general public, they want to, they want it to be a winner. Right. And if they think it's going to not be a winner because it's going to be too expensive, then don't release it. Just there's no yeah, reason I, to release it. I don't think that it's about money. I think they, they could, they could put out a $2,500 product. They're one of the few companies that could and probably sell a lot of those um, of those products probably more than anybody sold up until now in this in this vertical. Yeah, I, but I, I do I, think I paid sixteen hundred bucks and I don't even like Meta. Right, but what if right. it's not so, good enough <laughs> at twenty five hundred? Well, no, right? that, that's point, the, though, it's it's that combination, it's the value right? It's price and quality. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. And I think that 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 do they have the content that's going to make make it that's going to move the needle? Do they have you know the the um, again the tech? Is it going to is are is it going to be eight K per eye? You know, like that's really it has to be over 6k per eye um and pr preferably closer to 8k per eye or it's just not gonna it's it, it's not gonna turn the corner on at twenty five hundred dollars to your point um and so so those are the things that it has to be able to process you know it's it's a big thing i mean i think that we've se seen some rumors where they're talking about an m1 or m2 or m series for each eye you know to keep to keep that kind of flow through and then you have battery issues then you have you know connect connectivity issues but you're really looking at you got to be able to support probably four million polygons per eye and and eight K per eye, and that's a that is a it's a lot, you know. And and yeah. I think that that, but I think that that's where this, you know, and the longer you wait, and as Meta get, keeps on making it better, that has to that that bar may keep moving. But really, I don't think it's going to go much over that as far as what the requirements look like. Maybe more on the po polygonal side to get more detail, but but and, and the current phone does that, but it's different to have a phone than a than a uh, you know headset. Yeah. And you, and you still went up with the problem where if you're trying to make it a consumer product, how do you get around the fact that you look stupid while wearing them and you don't have a really good argument for why anybody needs this? Uh, it's a, I mean, there's a, the, the saving grace has always been that there are lots of corporations, lots of verticals that would love to have this sort of stuff, like uh, government, uh, any, any company that's in, that does spends a lot of money on training and maintenance, uh, medicine. So you can, you could you could do very, very well with a $2,000, $3,000 headset that serves those needs. But when when you're trying to when you're trying to create the next iPhone, it's going to be really, really super hard. You're going to have to you're going to Beat Saber is awesome. The idea of of having a having a virtual screen in front of you and a virtual screen to your left while you're while you're on an airplane. That's awesome. That's cool. That's that's great. It's just great. But you're not going to get people to keep this thing on their faces uh, and spend any kind of money for it until you well, tell them that this is something you can. This is something that will uh, solve problems for you and create opportunities for you. And no, I don't think anybody's cracked that yet. And I think that one of the things that that one of the big questions is how long are you going to put those on on your head to your yep. point? And I think that there's a lot of discussion that happens around that, because right now the setup, every time I set something, every, every time I put the headset on the setup of, of am I back in the environment that I'm in? This is something that Apple could potentially crack because they own all the devices where I'm I'm on Apple TV. I'm watching MLS. I want to see some extra thing during the ad. Let's say the ad that Apple sells me. I put that thing on. It has to, it knows that I'm watching that. It knows who I am and it immediately goes, I'm going to give you something. I don't have to sit there and hit buttons and do things and everything else. I watch something for a minute or two minutes or five minutes or whatever. And then I take it off. But the only reason that that works, the put on take off process is if you get rid of the setup. And right now for most of these headsets, putting something on now, like, especially if you're new at it, is a whole bunch of, you know, there's a whole bunch of debris that you have to work through um, before you get to what you're trying to do. And that's the, and I think Apple, again, because it has the whole ecosystem can solve that, but they have to, or they have to say, I'm going to give you long form, which I'm, I think that even they probably are taking time. I, I really have re reservations on the eye health related to as someone who's developed 360 for the last almost 10 years now, the eye health of keeping the headset on for a long time. I'm not certain that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's, it's, you know, for two hours or three hours watching a movie on it. I, I, I have some, I, I definitely have some concerns and of, of forcing your eyes to do that. I'm not sure that 50 years from now or 20 years from now, we'll think that, that was a good idea. We made lots of those mistakes in our, in the last hundred years. So <laughs> we talked last week about Evans Henke saying she's going to leave as Apple's head of design. A uh, number of articles coming out now in a variety of places saying this, uh, this design role 
is is hard to fill, and the and the uh, turnstile it's, revolving doors haven't haven't helped. But since Johnny Ive uh, left, in fact, even since Steve Jobs died, uh, it's been a problem. Uh, is this a problem we should be concerned about? Bloomberg is saying uh, the company is struggling to find the new design leader. Yeah, yeah there. This brain. I think brain drain in general is a problem at Apple, right? You've got a lot of people who've been there a long time, who've gotten paid a lot in Apple shares. Those shares are worth a lot of money. They don't need to maybe work on and work the hours and under the pressure. And like, I think that there is a brain drain uh, that is a broad issue, not just with a design group. Um, it does also sound in this case, like that that story by German, like he keeps listing names after names after names. But people have left. That, we didn't even it know It was Johnny. That. Johnny yeah. built a team and they were a tight Rick, team for a Rico lot of years. Zorkendorfer, Julian Honig, Miklu Silvanto, Daniel De Julius all left in 2019. Yeah, and, f and they, they had four people go to love from right from there to stay with Johnny. Like, it's yep. Johnny's team. It was a tight team. It Apple benefited it from it greatly, and they broke up, right? Because Johnny left, and and the, the, the band broke up eventually. And Evans Hankey was still there, but, like, this is the challenge is... Uh, we what have we learned about Apple, right? One, we've learned that people from the outside don't really flourish at Apple generally because Apple is its own thing. And then you've got a lot of people there who, who've got a lot of institutional knowledge, but they've also got a lot of stock options and they've made a lot of money and they've been grinding it for a decade or more. So they may not be inclined to stay. And you end up in this situation where uh, how do you build a new team? Is you've got to find somebody who gets Apple, who is uh, a leader and is going to be able to assemble the next team. And, you know, there's some speculation in there about it, but it is certainly uh, a quandary. And I think it's one of those things that's usually invisible to us on the outside, but I think is a constant problem now for Apple is how do you build up the farm team so that they're ready to take over uh, when you've had these 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 groups that have been together for years and have made all this stuff happen? How do you manage to make that kind of seamless transition to the next generation and it seems like with johnny leaving uh they're, they're kind of at, at 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 loose ends really to find out who they are going to have lead it yeah that, and that's kind of surprising because uh, in key positions one of the things that i think we all uh, appreciate about apple is that they do appreciate culture and continuity that they're not going to simply they rarely simply say you know what we need to shake things up we're going to bring in this person who used to work for uh, used to work for dell and they're going to be their head of the head of a uh, of keyboard research or whatever it's no that someone who has been with the company for 10 years understands exactly how apple works how it likes to do things what its priorities are what its resources are and can fit and excel within that environment and so the idea of not having someone who's not having an answer to the question, what happens when Johnny Ive uh, gets itchy feet and decides to and decides to leave? Uh, that's a little bit surprising to me that they didn't have that ready to go. Although the article was did did uh, maybe show off a uh, possible benefit to all this, that in the vacuum of leadership there without a very, very strong personality who's heading the design team operations was able to has been able to assert a, a, a firmer uh, a hand saying that well no we are we are not going to have like round keycaps we are we're going we're going to have something that is actually very very practical and inexpensive and un uncomplicated and doesn't really screw up the, the user experience for lots of people i don't care if the design makes you want to make the design of a of a of a, of a, of a traditionally placed USB port makes you want to throw up in your mouth, unquote. We are going to have it because that's what people want. And that's what will make this a very, very sane and practical design. So I would like to see a little bit more of that. I would also like to see colors in the in the uh, MacBook Air line. I'd like to see a little bit of Apple craziness, but I'm kind of glad that in the recent years we have seen a resort, a return to, wow, that is actually a very good looking, but also practical and functional design that I can work with uh, as to rely on as a $2,000 computer that's going to make me money. Hanky hasn't been in charge long enough to, uh, German points out, to oversee the end to end development of any released product. Um, it if, shows you how long it takes to make an Apple yeah, product. Yeah, that's right. Happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they also, he says, uh, there there's more of a focus on cost than before. Do you think that's chasing some designers out that they don't want to be constrained by cost? I mean, my always, first, first off, I think that they were constrained by cost always. They always and that have maybe, been. Yeah. Right. I think that there's some unrealistic uh, thought there. It may be that the, I mean, that was obviously the narrative in that uh, Trip Mickle book was that the, the people in charge of operations had more upper hand than the designers. But I think always designers have constraints that they have to work 
in and that that's just kind of part of it. I My guess is that this is this seems very much like a natural exodus of a long team that's breaking up over time. Um, but you do want a strong leader, right? I mean, you, the, a strong design leader, like the, the operations people are not going to be designing products. You need a strong design lead to say, here's what matters and here what uh, here's what doesn't matter, even under those constraints. Yeah. Well, we'll watch with interest. Apple's design is 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 super important to Apple's. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and I think that yeah, to, to Jason's point, I mean, I think a strong leader keeps a lot of people, and when there's just the the rest of them working together, um, and and then if there's, it's not so much that there aren't resource constraints, but there could be more a more practical view of some of those things, and and when they when they get constrained and they don't have that one person keeping them excited and keeping them focused. I could definitely see them looking for greener yeah. pastures because they they don't need to work anymore. I mean, if you've been there for Apple for exactly. twenty years, the golden to. handcuffs you don't need to. the golden handcuffs turn into golden wings yeah. at some point, and and then you just decide, do I really want to do this? Yeah. Um. There's a few other small stories I guess we could talk about. The level lock that was picked in thirty seconds is a three hundred dollar <laughs> Apple uh, <laughs> Home Kit lock. Every lock can be picked in thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, not well, yeah. not not exactly true. I, I had the same problem with a, another smart lock that I tried out. My my pick of the week a while ago was uh, a lo a simple like twenty dollar lock picking set from the lock the, the lock picking lawyer, the same people who did this video about this other smart lock. And when you find when you discover that all this is is like a tiny little bent piece of metal act, acting as a lever and a tiny little punched out piece of metal that just has like a little wave at the end of it, and you are opening it in three seconds i mean just three it's not like not like you've, you've got the the stethoscope against the door and you're you're sandpapering I'm, I'm saying that like after seeing like a, a simple video on how to use this you're op opening this lock in three seconds and then you go to a locksmith and say with this i, I went to a locksmith with this lock because i wanted to put it on my door and saying can you upgrade this lock for me and the the idea of wave picks have been around for decades lock manufacturers know how to build lock sets that defeat them and so for all of like thirty dollars i upgraded this thing they took out the old core put in a new core so that i can't pick it as a novice in five minutes excuse me in five seconds so yeah this is kind of a big deal i, I appreciate what they're saying where people most of the, it's it's not people who are picking locks who are getting into doors uh, they're people who are climbing into windows and taking advantage of unlocked doors but still i i'm I've always said that, that was my that was their response. The company's response to yeah. the uh, to the videos. My, well, my, my my bigger my biggest fear is not like the the professional cat burglar. My my biggest fear are like the the the, the knuckleheads, the chowderheads, who like at some point in the last five years saw a YouTube video about this. They bought a wave pick and they decided, that, hey, I wonder, hey, I wonder if I can open up this door. Hey, look, I can. Oh yeah, I think that I, I think that my neighbor Andy is gonna is, is out for the day because I don't see his bike parked outside. Uh, I think I'll just walk through and see what's around here like that's the that's the kind of knucklehead that i that i'm most afraid of that's the was the point of the video was this is a kind of rudimentary technique an expensive yeah. lock should not be vulnerable to it's uh, a 350 lock. Yeah. yeah it should yeah you need a higher quality of burglar yeah. in order to break into lock the, picking uh, lawyer i love that. The, i i i do feel oh, like amazing. the best the best locks best smart locks to get are either ones that let you use your own uh key way or whatever they call it or the ones that don't have a key yeah. at all yeah, yeah. um because yeah, then my, you have to use i mean and then people yeah they'll break their window or whatever but the, it, it because yeah there are if the lock picking lawyer has taught us anything is that it <laughs> it you know you can get into any lock and so maybe this one is is easy but like again you, the lock is there to it's a suggestion people from bar it's like putting you know back in the day <laughs> Please, putting a club on your car it is yeah. it is to dissuade people yes. from choosing to break into your house yeah, go that's to the next what it's house. for yeah, yeah. go to yeah. the one with the open window or door yeah. level says only four percent of houses are are uh, entered by a lock pick 38 percent are entered by unforced entry through an open window or door and uh lock picking yeah. lawyer says oh and watch me use a bump key to do this as well so yeah. yep <laughs> yeah i mean I'll, I'll, it, it's I'll say not, go ahead. but <laughs> at, clearly they at, spent at their money on on <laughs> on their tech and they've not spent it on. i i agree with andy the 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 mismatch here is it's a 330 and thirty lock that they obviously spend very little on the locking mechanism and it's a lock <laughs> people is, it's a lock funny. <laughs> sell a good lock yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it just doesn't take that much skill. Like it's, 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 to, to get most most locks, and, and and even with skill, it's so much easier to go through a, a window or, or or something else than than to go through a lock. I mean, it's you how know, do for, you know this, most, Alex? Most, 
<laughs> yeah, I blocked myself out of the house a lot. Oh, okay, good. So, right. but when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I, I I could I could open a combination lock faster without the without the combination than with the combination. Yeah. With the combination, I had to remember what it was. <laughs> without the combination, I just listened to the gates. You know, you just go. Do, 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 do. I go this way, this way, this way. They don't die. And um and so uh so it it it's not you know. But I spent a lot of time you know watching TV and having picking locks. It was a, it was a good pastime. Yeah. It's a very the popular end. hacker but, pastime. It's like the first. Oh yeah, the first nope. level yeah. of, of hacking. I, I got my son. When I got my the first. They now make the clear first, locks. The, go ahead. So you can see it while you're doing it. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Magic, I think magic and lock picking are two of the common like yeah. cultural. Uh, when you learn that like all, every lock, every lock is a lie, and that people can be fooled with magic with very very simple tricks, it changes your outlook on the entire world. <laughs> um, but but yeah, but this this is but the, I mean the la the last thing I'll point out is that do you remember like the time where you'd be walking down the street and you see wow that's a, I keep seeing a lot of big white plastic big pens that the end is kind of like all scratched up and flared out. I wonder why that is. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly. because, like, the, the, it became, it became, it spread like wildfire. The knowledge that a big pen was exactly, if you just jam it into a bike lock with a circular keyway yeah. and just keep rubbing it, it will pop open. And now, now the bike locks don't work that way. But that's the sort of thing you, you're afraid of. Again, not the professionals, but the people who were like, are who will st steal a bike if they find out, hey, wow, there's this really easy. I'm not, I'm not going to invest the time, money, and expertise to learn how to pick a circular keyway. But if I find out from somebody that, hey, there's a cool trick that you can just take this big pen in your pocket and open up any bike lock that turns them into a knucklehead who will probably take your bike and then just simply throw it into a ravine after they're done with it because they weren't interested in stealing it anyway the lock is a lie says andy every lock is oh, a yeah. lie <laughs> yufi has launched uh, a uh, find my compatible uh smart tracker yufi which is anchor's uh, consumer electronics division uh, does some good about stuff. A year too late. <laughs> yeah. Well, it works with uh, Find My, right? So it's a little cheaper yeah. than an AirTag. Uh, it's also it looks like a little bigger and bulkier than an AirTag. Uh, Apple has officially certified the security smart track link. So it's a it's a it's a made for iPhone thing. Nineteen ninety nine is a single single unit. Forty bucks for a two pack. Get the bundle for fifty bucks. That includes a yard sign. <laughs> saying protected by Yuffie security, which is pretty funny since this isn't a lock. Uh, a yard, so yard, so yard size saying, burglars, please Google Yuffie and how to override <laughs> for instructions on how to break into our, ho our home. It can play yep. an alarm and has a replaceable CR2032 battery. It can last up to a year. Hey, I have to replace, I did get a notice from my uh, AirTags. It's been a year to replace the battery. Is that pretty easy to do? Do you just unscrew it? Yeah, I, I think so. Mine too. Yeah, you, it, and don't nice and don't buy the you. one, don't buy the one with the bitter coating because it's actually too thick. The one that keeps kids from eating batteries, you need to buy the ones without the bitter coating. No <laughs> bitter coating. There's no tolerance. Yeah, <laughs> That's it's true. I didn't even know it's they made one, batteries with true. a bitter coating. That's they do. You haven't been tasting your batteries. Well, no. your little kids are, and so they make them with bitter coating. But <laughs> Ew, those don't those don't have the tolerance. <laughs> Yeah, send it back. Waiter, I need a new battery, a sweeter battery than this one. So I just uh, unscrewed the <laughs> sugar coated sure sugar coated that. batteries. That's the that's the next yeah. next big thing. Oh man. Yeah. Uh all right, let's take a break and come back with your picks of the week, boys and girls. Our show today brought to you uh, as all our shows are by the wonderful folks in Club Twit. Thank you, Club Twit members. If you're not a member, let me encourage you. It is really becoming more and more important. Uh, we're facing quite a shortfall in 2023. And Club Twit, the burden is on you <laughs> to make up the difference. <laughs> but I have to say, I think you get value for a dollar. Uh, it's $7 a month. You can get a yearly plan. It's $84. It's not, it's not less expensive. You can also get a, a corporate plans. Uh, those are discounted for large numbers of people. What do you get? Ad-free versions of all of our shows. We don't need to put an ad in there we don't need to track you we don't need to do anything because you're you're paying us which is nice you also get the bonus content which will include i believe today andy's rendition of um <laughs> what was it you were singing I it, was, it, was, it was it was a medley of tom jones hits <laughs> yeah, tom jones singing prince song kiss uh it's quite good quite good mm -hmm. and i think we had a hand uh dancing from the other panelists <laughs> <laughs> yep. There's a lot going on. There was lot a lot going, going on. on. That should we be part of We had some technical difficulties. That'll and, be, yeah, yep. well, technical <laughs> difficulties are the best kind. Turn into magic. As soon as, yeah. as, 
as soon as we found out that the new that the new Zoom hardware, the new Zoom software we're going to be using next week allows us to synchronize much much better. Yeah, there was there, there was a lot of EDM going on. That oh, was great. A, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that will be part of the Trip Plus feed. Plus, we also put shows that we don't uh, put out in public. There are club only shows like Hands on Mac, Micah Sargent's great show, uh, Hands on Windows with Paul Therott, the Untitled Linux show. We also have the Giz Fizz, Stacy's Book Club. There's a lot of stuff that we do in the club. And and I have to say, it all centers around our wonderful Discord, which is uh, the best social network ever. If you want to hang out with a few thousand people who are Twit listeners and viewers who are interesting, savvy, cool, and marvelous dancers, this is the place uh, <laughs> to, to be. It's not just uh, discussions about the shows, by the way. We have all the geek topics in there. and You can add more if you want. Uh, it really is a lot of fun. So seven bucks a month, you get the Discord, you get the ad-free versions of all the shows, you get shows we don't put out anywhere else, you get content from pre and post shows that we don't put out anywhere else. I think that's a good deal. We're trying to make it really valuable to you because it is so valuable to us. Um, if you uh, if we want to think of what Twit's going to look like in the years ahead, the club is a very important uh, part of this. So thank you, club members. And if you're not a member, twit.tv slash club twit. And I thank you in advance. Uh, somebody wants an all ad channel in club twit. Beat you to it. <laughs> it's not a it's not a podcast, but there is a section in the club twit discord called all the ads. Somebody said, well, I want the ads. So we just put all the ads into, into the all the ads section. So, there's you know, if you want the ads, you get the ads. If you want them, but only if you want them. Twit.tv slash club twit. Now, pick of the week time. I'm going to start because there's been a big move uh, away from Twitter of late into something we've been doing for a long time. In fact, if you look at my lower third for the last few years, it's not said at Leo Laporte on Twitter. It said twit.social slash at Leo. That is our uh, Mastodon instance, open to all, but it's pretty much designed for people who listen uh, to our shows. I have it in the advanced mode, so it looks a lot like a tweet deck. And it's become a, a Elon-free so <laughs> microblogging network that's really, really great. You're all welcome to join it, but I see a lot of people join us. Stern just uh, joined it from the Wall Street Journal saying, well, what's the iOS app? Because the web is great. On your desktop, there's a web app. There actually uh, there are also apps for Mac OS for the desktop. But if you want to use it on iOS, there are maybe a half dozen different Mastodon apps because it's an open source project. It's open. There's a strong API. It uses ActivityPub. So a lot of people have written apps, but this is the best one. It's open source and free from Metabolist. It's called MetaText. So more, this is more informational. It has. It also supports the, uh, the iPhone, uh, the iPad as well as the iPhone. So it's really a nice uh, way to use Mastodon. So if you are in our Twit social Mastodon or any other Mastodon uh, and you want to uh, participate in that in, in lieu of Twitter or even, I guess you could do both, uh, but why? Uh, meta text from Metabolist, really, really good. Uh, Alex Lindsay, your pick of the week. Yeah, so I was, I'm, I'm on a lot of lists and one app that started to bubble up among CG artists is a, and that, that I opened up and really enjoy is called Nomad. Nomad is a 3D sculpting program. If you've ever heard of something like Form Z, um, not Form Z, but ZBrush, <laughs> I got the Zs mixed up, but ZBrush, um, it is very much like ZBrush. It works on your phone. And so basically what you can do is simply paint in 3D. So you're basically, you, you can just, you can just sculpt with your finger and, and start building models. And there's a lot of, you know, professional tools, again, similar, it's a simplified version from what you would see in something like ZBrush, but it's, um, it is a, it's a great little app that runs on your phone. There's a couple other ones. There's Forger that, that also works on the, on the iPad, but you can see some of the tools, some of the stuff here uh, and the people are sculpting. This is sculpting with their finger on a phone. Um, That's so you know, cool. Days. And so, um, so anyway, so there's, there is a, it's a really, I, I, I'm going to apologize ahead of time that even if you're not, if you don't see yourself as a sculptor, um, these apps 
can suck up an enormous amount of your time. Oh, it has an iPad. There's so That's much good. fun. Yeah. Yeah. And so there, there's so much fun to, to use. And you're simply just kind of, and, you know, unlike clay, you can go do something else very quickly without having to wash your hands. Um, and um, and you can undo and you can um, you can do all those other things. And I've been playing with some version of these uh, for the last 20 years. Um, and um, it's just really... The, the, the fact that you can do something at the level that this app is working at um, is is pretty amazing. So it's a it's called Nomad, and it's uh, it's available on uh, iOS. Uh, iOS. I mean, there might be a desktop version, but it's what I'm what I'm playing with is on the phone, which is kind of amazing. Um, also, as a side note, um, I, I just wanted to say that Zoom had Zoomtopia had their their keynote today, and they mentioned something that I thought Leo, you'd like to know in, What's in that? addition to Zoom ISO. Yes. Um, they, it's not shipping yet, but they announced that they're going to have double end recording. Oh, good. So That's we great. don't do that. You don't do that here, but, but for no, we're lazy. those of us who, who do podcasts, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's, it's like, you, you do know, a lot of double enders, to... Jason, right? Everything is double under. Yeah. So That's where you record on recording. both ends and then you send your file up to the host or the editor yep. and then he puts it together and it sounds like you're all in the same room. We get such good results at Zoom. I don't even feel like we need to do that to be honest yeah it, because a lot of a lot of folks that get on generally have good c connectivity but what if you have not great uh, connectivity and, yeah. and so we double in some things where when we watch it live it's breaking up and it's doing all kinds of other things and then when we get the file back we're like oh that's quite nice <laughs> so, yeah that's so, a good so way to do it yeah yeah so so um that's good. just another little side tip Thank it's you, not, not a real tip tip yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, it's Nomad Sculpt. If you're looking for it, there are other Nomads oh, in the App Store. You know, it's funny is like, there's a lot of Nomads, and I thought Nomad Sculpt. Uh, I, I, I that's just what I searched. I was like looking for it when someone said, "Oh, Nomad, Nomad, Nomad," and I just thought, well, it'll be some kind of sculpture well, version of something. You were smart, but just in case, and, uh, fifteen yeah, yeah. dollars. Fifteen dollars, and it's a you know, but but not a subscription. No in-app purchases, <laughs> just fifteen bucks. That's I, I don't know. I haven't seen any in-app in purchases in it. it um, doesn't say any in-apps. It doesn't. Yeah. It's so and it's and it it is. God, and they don't collect an any enormous, data. <laughs> um, because what would yeah, they collect? And, yeah, exactly. And yeah. and I don't. I mean, it's so full featured. I can't. I, I I'm again kind of amazed of how much got packed into a phone, and and then how smooth it works. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, really neat. Andy, pick of the week. Uh, mine is a keyboard that just came out a couple months ago from DOS Keyboard. Oh, don't do this to me. The, I bought the DOS last time. Oh, uh, no. So this is so this is the Mac Tiger T-I-G-R keyboard. Yes. Uh, which is, a, to me, it's a, it's a nice kind of hybrid between the sort of like ultra clicky, 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 like full throw keyboard that people like me tend to favor and like the flat kind of keyboard that you get from the like Apple's magic keyboard or the keyboard that's on your notebook. Uh, so they are like full throw there, there, there are full throw mechanical keys. However, the, they are half height keys, but it is that they feel great. They are cherry MX switches, which is very, very high quality switch. It's two and a half pounds because it's mounted on a base plate of pre-framulated emulite, uh, or I don't know what metal it is, but basically, <laughs> basically that was great. I was like, hey, yeah, yeah, uh, it's aluminum unibody stainless steel top. Exactly, but but the for me that's that's kind of like a, 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 a an absolute like necessity because I hate cheap plastic keyboards that like skid yeah. across the the it's got type skid across C USB on the back. I it also right that. it's it's hardwired it's hardwired USB cable, but it also has it also has two high speed <sighs> USB C pass throughs for charging and for just like hooking up like cameras mm -hmm. and phones and things like that. And it duplicates exactly the layout of the Apple Magic Keyboard, uh, so all the keys are exactly where you'd expect them to be if you're move if you're switching between uh, a uh, between a, a mobile keyboard and this one or a magic keyboard I also like you know I call me a little soft but I like having like an actual knob for volume uh, and so it's actual actual volume knob and you turn the knob I love and you actually that. see the yeah yeah because I'm not like the old dust keyboard that I bought on your recommendation had that and I really loved that yeah yeah I mean there, there are a lot of creature comforts to it and also the 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 keyboard that I do most of my typing on is, is a code keyboard that I bought like five or six mm -hmm. or seven years ago which is still going great the 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 uh, uh, the illumined back the back illumin illumination on the letter D is flickering a little bit so I could I call it I, I say that my 
my D is not very tenacious, but it's still a very, very worthy keyboard. Uh, but, <laughs> I get uh, but, it. I get it. Exactly. I got thank it. you very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, but the, the only, but that that does bring up the only complaint that I kind of have. Excuse me, my code keyboard doesn't have like Mac specific keycaps on it. If you're if you're building your own keyboard, of course you can order custom keycaps that have all the Mac stuff on it. I have to remember that like the Windows key is the command key, and uh, I, I twinge a little bit as a as a, as a purist. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it is that this isn't a cheap keyboard. It is. It's. I think it's. It, I think it's priced correctly for how it's built. Uh, but for two hundred and twenty dollars. I wish I really wish it were backlit. That's something that feels like it should be table stakes for a, yeah. a keyboard that costs more than 200 bucks uh, because I don't. And uh, honestly, you don't if you don't have a backlit keyboard, you don't recognize how important it is until like, the first time you have to switch to a non backlit one. And you're realizing that, oh, I have to put another light on my desk just to make sure that I can find the home keys really, really nicely without having to flash flood uh, light with everything. But uh, but I think that this is a really, really good good substitute for people who are not into spending three, four, five hundred dollars on like the ultimate, oh no, if it's not like the blah, 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 with solid gold, uh, spring back keys, blah, 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 blah uh, and custom colors and that sort of stuff it is a very, very nice upgrade for people who do lots and lots and lots of writing, uh, lots and lots of work on the keyboard and have sort of had this idea in their head that maybe this keyboard they've got on their notebook or the keyboard they've got on the low profile uh, Logitech or Magic Keyboard just ain't cutting for them. It will take, like any keyboard, it's going to take you a day or two to get used to just simply the fact that it's a different keyboard than what you're what you're using. But after that, uh, it's it's not at all difficult to use. It's it's just any keyboard. And like I said, nice nice transition for a lot of people. I wonder why Apple doesn't make a mechanical keyboard. It'd be interesting to see what they would do. I maybe, think they'd do well. Maybe because it's, yeah. I don't know. Maybe because it's just so well covered, like elsewhere. Yeah. So when you when you're dealing with a keyboard or a mouse, they're free to make like the really wacky, super ultra design looking one because they know that if people don't like it, hey, there's. I mean, my my mouse my mouse of choice is like this cheap, like thirty five dollar like Logitech uh, wireless mouse uh, because it's it's sculpted nicely, it has extra buttons on it. I really like it. I can't use the Magic Mouse; it's just absolutely unusable to me. But I'm glad that as a sculptural object, uh, at least during the Joni Ive period, they might they made something that they wanted to make, and it's a very Apple looking mouse. But I've come to like the Magic Mouse only because I can swipe on it. It's the charging is ridiculous because yeah. you have to charge it in the butt, but the swiping is nice. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I just can't. Like I said, I love the fact a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I'm doing. Those MX at my mice desk, are great. They're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, my, my hand is resting on the mouse and scrolling through things that I'm reading or looking through an archive to find the thing I want to do. I can't like hold this thing like it's a like, like it's a piece of like it's a piece of like French marge, marzipan pastry. I have to hold it delicately by the edges and <laughs> oh no, but I, did, I didn't mean to touch it there. I did touch it there, and now I've clicked someplace. I just uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad people who like it like it. I I don't like it, so I'll I'll take my thirty five dollar vulgar plastic mouse any day of the well, week. Well, the other reason I like it, I'm a lefty, and so um, a lot of the Logitech mice are righty mice, and I exactly yeah I like a, at a ambiguous mice mouse. Uh, thank you, Andy. Jason. Uh, by the way, I just bought the keyboard. Jay <laughs> took me no time. Excellent. Took me no time. I love my old dust uh, boot, but. Uh, it got snuck, das, bo, das keyboard, not das boot. Uh, it got, I have some boots from Das, but uh, but the keyboard is what we're talking about. Um, it might, got snagged by somebody, and now I, I miss it, so I'm going to get a new one. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jason Snell. Pick up yes, sir. Um, okay, so remember RSS before there was all this Twitter yeah, yeah, nonsense? Yeah. People just read things on blogs yeah, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so when Google Reader died, uh, a few different companies kind of emerged as alternatives. One of them is Feedbin. It's still out there. It is a web interface for RSS. It also will sync to RSS clients. There are many popular RSS clients. It's $5 a month, $50 a year. But the reason I wanted to mention it is not only, yes, is RSS still a thing you can get in a lot of places and that there's value in that, but my favorite feature of Feedbin is... It comes with an email address and you can send 
all of your newsletters that ever because everybody's oh, got hallelujah. newsletter now send all your newsletters to your feedbin oh, email address nice. and they show up in the feedbin reader or in your rss reader of choice so every morning when i wake up and i get my cup of tea and i get my little english muffin and i'm sitting there reading stuff i'm using net newswire on ios on an ipad and i'm reading newsletters from substack and elsewhere all of which have just been poured right in aside my rss feeds in that newswire thanks to feedbin and that is why i pay fifty dollars a year for feedbin is i really love the idea of giving i was not reading my newsletters in my email client right like my email client is not a place i want to be in general we already established before the show i try not to even read my email uh that often uh, i definitely don't want to sit there and read newsletters in there and so i forward them all I'm using Gmail. You verify your feedbin address in Gmail and then set up some rules. And suddenly all my emails are coming straight into feedbin. And I think technically my Substack username now or user ID is literally my feedbin address mm. because that was the easiest way to do it was just to change my address on Substack to be feedbin. So if you if you want to do newsletters but you are frustrated about and and Substack has their own app. If that if you're only doing Substack, you could just use the Substack app. But if you want to pick and choose and get them from all over, maybe try uh, the Feedbin email service because I use it and love it, and it has become a regular part of my life, my so life, and my day, and everything. Yeah. So they do have an iPad, an iOS reader app. Feedbin does. Yeah, you can use Feedbin's but app. You, like you can you, you can use Reader. You can use Net Newswire. I yeah. I love Net Newswire, and so I just have been using that, and it, it's gotten me into RSS reading as well. But yeah, Feedbin's got one too, and then they've got their web app that you can use from anywhere. Okay. Wow. Now you now you got me. You know, I still use RSS every day, uh, all the time. Yeah. Uh, to, because that's how we do our beat checks. You know, that's how I look for news. You could follow people in Mastodon in RSS. You could follow YouTube channels in RSS. Um, so having a good RSS reader is great. I love this idea of having my newsletters go to it, though. I really yeah, it's like it, that. Literally anything you can send via email, you can stick in there, which is pretty great. Uh, I really like that. Yep. Feedbin at feedbin.com. Thank you, Mr. Snell. You'll find sure. Jason at sixcolors.com. His incomparable podcasts are truly incomparable uh all his podcasts are available uh through the website sixcolors.com slash podcasts uh true. anything you'd like to plug uh sure the incomparable.com is a fun network of pop culture podcasts so sure if you want is. To hear us talk about nerdy nerdy things uh that are not technology give yourself a break after listening to many tech podcasts we are talking about fun stuff over there so that's you know it's it's all it's all good stuff uh you can find something that you care about if it's a movie or a TV show or whatever. You can find something about it over there. Fair or just nice. actual play D&D. &D. Total Party Kill. We play D&D &D <laughs> on the internet. We're not using Zoom ISO yet, but we will probably very soon because we roll like that. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Zoom ISO is awesome. Uh, as soon as we use it, and even if we don't use it, the singing before we use it is fantastic. <laughs> it's the Thank best. You. <laughs> Thank you, Andy Anako, WGBH in Boston. When can we hear you there? Thursday at 1230. Uh, I'm at the BPL studio, so come on down to the BPL and watch it live. Or if you can't come into Boston on Thursday afternoon, the day before Labor Day, uh, day before uh, Veterans Day, uh, go to WGBHnews.org to stream the audio live or later. Or go, or go to the WGBH News YouTube channel to also see the video streamed live or later. Nice. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Mr. Alex Lindsay, boy, you got to check out officehours.global, his amazing world swallowing thing, <laughs> Sabado <laughs> Gigante. Um, what's up on office hours these days? You know, we had a great, uh, <laughs> great session Th because Zootopia is this week, you know, like when Apple does something, it's a lot of Apple stuff for a week and yeah. this week it's all, we're thinking a lot about zoom. So we, uh, we had actually someone who's building entire events and has built this whole OBS, platform using the SDK. So he was on this morning talking, you know, through that. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about what we saw in the keynote. Thursday, members, you know, Andy and other folks from the Zoom team are actually going to come on and 
answer our questions. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, so, and then, and then on Friday we're talking. We've been we made a, made a big move last weekend, which is that we had a small rack and we had to move all the hardware that runs our show to a large rack. And of course, because we're on every day, we had 24 hours to do it, or really more like 22 hours to do it. Not that we were counting, and that all went well. But we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what we're doing with our what we call Office Hours 2.5, which is you know us adding, you know fully integrating all the Zoom ISO stuff so we have all the isolated feeds so that we can, um, you know, resync resync everybody's audio, um, have control over all of those bits and pieces. So that's our, that's kind of our next, our next thing. It's the R&D so, um, lab for everything we do here. That's for sure. We, yeah, we have a lot of fun. You must, so you must be- watch officehours.global for more information or for an invite to join the show live as a participant. And of course, if you want to hire Alex, 090.media is the uh, is the business the business end of the stick thanks to andy carluccio from zoom who has helped us a lot with the zoom iso he came by friday and he's a, he's a pretty smart guy up. yeah we really appreciate his help he's okay. great yeah <laughs> and thanks to all of you uh club twip members and uh, regular listeners we appreciate your being here uh we do mac break weekly on uh, tuesdays and now we are in daylight uh, we are out of daylight saving time we're in standard time so it's tuesday 11 a.m pacific 2 p.m. Eastern, 1900 UTC. The live stream is at twit.tv slash live. IRC.twit.tv is a place everyone is invited to chat. Of course, if you're already in the club twit, you can chat with the Discord as well. Uh, After the fact, on-demand versions of the show are available, edited, polished up, ready for your delectation at your leisure at twit.tv slash mbw. There is a dedicated YouTube channel as well for Mac Break Weekly. You can watch there. It's also a great way to share clips with other people because YouTube supports that very nicely. After the fact, just, uh, you know, subscribe. And that way you'll get it automatically. You don't even have to think about it. Um, All of the podcast clients out there know about Mac Break Weekly. We've been doing this since 2005. So there's not a one of them doesn't have us. So search for Mac Break Weekly or better yet, search for the Twit Network Subscribe to the shows you want. You'll get them automatically. And if you'd like to leave a review, it really helps us tell the world about your love for Backbreak Weekly. Don't tell it about your hate, though, because we that, you should keep that a secret. That's <laughs> not, not nice to share that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time. Now, get back to work, because break time is over. Bye. If you are looking for a midweek update on the week's tech news, I got to tell you, you got to check out Tech News Weekly. See, it's all kind of built in there with the title. You get to learn about the news in tech that matters. Every Thursday, Jason Howell and I talk to the people making and breaking the tech news, get their insights and their interesting stories. It's a great show to check out. Twit.tv slash TNW.